Welcome to Real Life Fiction. I'm Matt James with Conundrum Publishing, international best-selling author of The Blood King. And today I'll be talking to author Richard F. Padden. Rich, how you doing? Thanks for coming on the show, my friend. Oh, I'm very good, and 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 thank you for having me on. Um, I don't know if we're, if this is going to be technically the first time, or we're going to count it as the second time I've been on the show. Yeah, no the uh, the first time was uh, your RF Black Zone persona, yes, and uh, your monster and creature features and stuff. But since you've um, kind of switched gears and and moved on to um, traditional action thrillers. And uh, your your first action thriller is out now. Um, your second one will be uh, published next month. And then, yep. you know, you and I have a project that we're working on together. Um, I just thought it was a good time to have you on to talk about, like, your current projects. And um, a lot of the subject matter from the first interview I had with you is going to change, too, because the, uh, like, your influences, for instance. Influences when you were doing like your creature feature stuff is a lot different than the influences that oh. you would want to talk about in depth for your action thriller stuff. So yeah. it, it's, it's going to be a, 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 just a different conversation altogether. So, I th but either way, just with your stuff coming out, um, you know, figured it would be a good time to have you on, on real life fiction. Oh, no, I, I'm, I'm, it's, you know, I'm always happy to come on and spend an hour or so talking with you. I mean, we do it every week anyway. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We do it on our other podcast on armchair directors, which an hour would be, would be short for the two of us. So that would be, that would be really short actually, uh, considering most well, of our yeah, podcasts see, are two plus hours. <laughs> yeah. But that's because we're talking movies here. Yeah. We're talking about just me. <laughs> that is true. Yeah. Talking books and talking rich. It's like a 27 minute conversation. Yeah. Probably, yeah I'm, so. I'm, I'm, honestly, I'm not that interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man! Now, no, now so, we set up. We set up the. We've set up everyone's expectations, and now we can wow them. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, just for, for the audience that may not have um, listened to the Arf Blackstone episode, or things you want to just include that maybe we didn't talk about, or just want to expand on a little more. But um, regardless, at least um, for the new listeners, um, tell us a little bit about yourself, a little bit of your background, and um, kind of why you do what you do. Okay, so um, I'm. If you can't tell from the uh, accent, I'm a, a Australian. Um, if you can tell by the accent, congratulations, you're ahead of the crowd. Yeah. Um, I've. <laughs> we're off to a good start. Aren't we're we? off to a good start. We're we're yeah. off to a normal start. I'm a little, and I'm a little bit more nervous now because because you know I know this is going to be a video as well, so i can, i can't get away with all the usual stuff i do when we do armchair direct yeah yeah there's a lot of uh, hand signals and pantomiming that the camera doesn't uh and, and quite show. a lot of a lot of these moments of i just said that um so yeah i'm an I'm, I'm i'm an australian i am i've been writing and telling stories pretty much all my life um i spent about uh 10 years or so 10 or 15 years i think it was trying to break into the movie business as a uh, script writer and when that didn't come to fruition, um, I, I moved to Mexico where I started writing. And um, funny enough, my first book was a spy thriller. I, I, so I've always wanted to write thrillers. Um, and I sent it to a couple of publishers and they told me no, <laughs> in no uncertain terms. And one of them did kindly say, it's, it's missing something. And so I, you know, Trying to figure, I reread it and realized, yeah, they were right. And trying to figure out what was missing, you know, that that special source that takes it to the next level. Sure. And I decided to add zombies to the story, <laughs> and Seven Press, gratefully, you know, I'm so grateful to them. They picked it up and they published it, and that started the five years, yeah, five and a bit years of writing, as you called it, creature features, um, which. That's that's all Stephen Sommers inspired stuff. To be honest, everything yeah. I've written, it, that stuff go you can you can trace it back to Stephen Sommers easily. Yeah, and and we've talked about it. I mean, stuff like that's really really fun to write, but yeah. um, depending on your your track record or depending on your um, your following, uh, it can sometimes cap you and limit you. 
with yeah. uh, expansion because it, it, it's just it's a small subgenre of interest for a lot of readers. So they are very fun to write, but it's kind of one of those things where you have to be like really, really good at it or you just have to get really, really lucky with a few books to do a lot in that genre. Yep, or so. you've just got to pump them out. Yeah, quick, like yeah, you know, yeah. like a book every every month or every two months kind of scenario. Yeah. Um, to- totally agree with what you said, with all that, yeah. man. And that was the thing I I started to realize. Um, this was probably twenty in twenty twenty. Um, I I didn't write much in twenty twenty due to personal stuff going on. And when I came back to writing, I kind of realized that I started to realize, sorry, that I was writing more thrillers, and the creatures were the afterthought. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, and I kept writing with Severed, um, and you know, I moved back to Australia and it was basically, um, mid like end of 2021, beginning of 2022, where I started to go, nah, you know what? I can't keep writing this. Yeah. I've got to, I've got to write something different. And I've always wanted to write a proper spy book. Um, so in between books for Severed, I did that. I wrote a, a, a proper spy novel called the principal mm-hmm. and it sucked <laughs> it was <laughs> oh it, it was horrific it was boring even the action sequences were boring and i i have this um this thing i do where if i think something i've written is boring i'm pretty sure the readers are going to think the same thing <laughs> yeah because you if you're not a fan of the content then how can you expect someone else to yep. be the fan of the content, especially since you're the one that produced it. So I mean, I yeah, exactly. So it's and yeah. it's also the reverse. If I if I write something and then I reread it and go, that is really cool, then I know the readers are going to think that's cool too. Um, yeah. At least I hope they do. So yeah, I mean, for the most part, that's that's uh, that's a that's a safe way to think with a lot of this because because yeah. you and I are we're, we're we're media fans of this stuff more than anything. You know, when it comes oh, yeah. to the movies and video games and that kind of stuff. So you know, it, we see what we like we know what we like and you know when you're talking you know your indiana joneses your uncharted your you know mummy 99 that kind of stuff you're just like it's a widely loved you know subject and genre so it's you know it's like wow you know if i get excited as a fan and i'm the one writing it i'd like to say that's a safe bet that the reader is going to like it as well so exactly or like you know you're a huge james bond fan so i mean there's well yeah that's it yeah. that's it you know you, for you it's indie and mummy 99 and all that and i'm a fan mm-hmm. of both of those but yeah. i do gravitate towards more the bonds the mission impossibles the yeah um the john wicks and mm-hmm. you know some crime stuff so um yeah it, it's one of those things tracking what i had written for severed i kind of realized yeah i was writing thrillers and then having to fill in you know, having them add the yeah. monsters. You know, prime example is um, a book I put out with them called The Valley of Beecho, which that is a group of Australian special forces in um, the Mexican jungle, um, and they're transporting a drug cartel boss, and they get attacked by giant bugs. You know, yeah. it, it, proper proper creature features fair. Right? That one, you can change the giant bugs to just, just you know, the cartel men, crooked cops, this book's going to be the same. Yeah. I did one um, that was uh, Game On, which is a group of people get taken to a small tropical island. They're hunted by the one percenters, and there are dinosaurs on the island. Yeah. And the first version I wrote of that, 75% was a straight thriller about these people being hunted. And then in the last 25% of the book, the dinosaurs show up. <laughs> yeah so yeah i can see where you're yeah where your head where your head is at with these books yeah 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 and so it was one of those things where i was like you know what i can't keep writing those i've got to i've got to write what i want to write which yeah which is the um you know action thrillers spy thrillers um assassin thrillers let's call them and Mm -hmm. i I, honestly i've been loving right i've been loving writing those and the ideas have been coming so fast and <laughs> yeah you know. no i mean I, I i did the same thing where i dabbled in different genres for a little bit because you, you get you get these like cool ideas for stories but you're like mm. you know i'm not a science fiction author i'm not a horror author but that like it's so funny i love writing the stuff but i can't stand watching it 
It's just like <laughs> I don't like 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 the space horror stuff. It, it, it like that, but writing it or science fiction horror, writing it's so fun. That, but yep. it's like you know you you go off genre too much too far and you start to alienate your reader base which you you know in my case which i've built up over the last you know eight plus years and i built them up under the action adventure genre uh, or yep. the umbrella of action adventure stuff action thriller stuff and you know when i would veer it would sell but it wouldn't sell long term it would sell and then drop off and so it was like one of those things where it was like, oh, that was a good run. And then the book's kind of dead in the water. And I'm yeah. like, all right, well, the action adventure stuff for me sells and it keeps going because it's just, you know, the reader base, you know, readers will save for later and then eventually get back to it. But a lot of the time when they see what the book's about after they've saved it, they'll unsave it and they just won't buy it because it's a genre that they are not, uh, I guess, comfortable reading or enjoy reading. So yeah. when I dedicated, rededicated myself to just very, very strict um, action adventure based stories, um, I really kind of relaxed because I'm like, there's so much that I can write and there's nothing I feel like I'm going to struggle with. Yep. And, and, and honestly, that's the same, same yeah. thing that's happened with me. Same I mean, exact thing you're doing now. Because I wrote uh, the first version of the principle, I wrote at the beginning of 20, yeah. um, 22. And then I did game on. And then I was like, right, I got to start working on, you know, rewriting the, um, the principle. And instead, I pitched an idea to Severed Press because I'm an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it was one of those things I pitched it thinking he'll never, you know, like I pitched a bunch of ideas. And he, you know, the, the um, editor, Gary, goes, you know, okay, we'll take this idea. And it was the one idea I didn't want to write because I always throw in just the ideas I kind of really want to write. And then I always throw one extra. Yeah. Usually that's the one he goes for. Um, so I was like, oh, okay. He sent the contract. Now I could have said no and focused on the principle, but I thought, you know what? I'm going to write it anyway. <laughs> yeah. And I, and I wrote it. And at the same time, I was, I came up with, two pitches for a uh, little little publishing house called Conundrum Publishing. Hmm. Who are they? And, <laughs> yeah. And, and, and the, the, those pitches were very basic. Um, one of them, you know, neither of them had titles. That's the thing. They didn't have titles, didn't have anything except an elevator pitch. And it was, uh, the first one was um, a um, Latin American ex-assassin gets back into the life after... Um, there, um, after the man who saved her from it gets uh, killed by a um, NSA hit squad. That was the original pitch for what turned into the Blood Angel. Yeah. And then the um, second pitch was 007 gets stuck in a time loop, like Groundhog Day. That's yeah. that's that's the second. That was the second pitch. So very very basic pitches. Um, and I did those before I before I found out you had before you announced you were working with Conundrum. Yeah. <laughs> and and when you when you announced that, Pami went, "Ooh, I've got an in. Should I tell him I've pitched? Nah, doesn't matter. I'll let it go." <laughs> yeah, because I wasn't involved in that part of it right away. It could, it took a month yeah. or two for me to get involved with the submissions part, and then when I got involved with the submissions part, um, I saw your pitches, and then I think I messaged you and and went like, "Hey, uh, I just saw," or whatever the conversation ended up being, and. Um, I remember uh, sending the the uh, what ended up being the Blood Angel. Uh, ended up I, I sent uh, Nick the pitch for it, and he's like, "Yeah, sounds good." <laughs> he's just like, okay, because yeah, because yeah, we yeah we had that conversation, and you were asking me a couple of questions about it. I'm thinking, mm -hmm. oh, okay, so he's read the pitches and all that, and you said yeah. something along the lines of, "We will probably take both." <laughs> that was that was basically it. Then maybe a couple of weeks later maybe not even that you sent me a message saying oh nick's going to email you and yeah. and honestly for me i i always have that thing of no expectations no disappointments that's always sure you know philosophy and in, in this industry well any entertainment industry or any yeah well yeah yeah um and when you said nick's going to email me i'm thinking oh cool you know like mm -hmm. I, I i got a little excited because you know it's nick thacker and yeah. i'm a fanboy <laughs> 
And then I got the email and it was, you know, can you send us a manuscript? And I'm thinking, what, for which one? <laughs> Because that's all it said. It didn't say for well, which story. So I, I, I replied saying which one, and goes either whichever you got on hand. <laughs> <laughs> and and I met, I've I've replied to his emails while messaging you saying, well, I I've got nothing since I'm you know this is the scenario the situation. And I remember you just said, whenever you get it to us, don't worry, <laughs> you we you know you're not going to be forgotten. No. And that was all under our that was all going to be under our Blackstone. Yeah. That, that's how I pitched it. Everything was pitched as RF Blackstone. And then, you know, as I got geared up to do, um, to write the first book for uh, Blood Angel, you, you, sat, you sat down and had a little chat with me. <laughs> it was a heart to heart and just a re realistic conversation on um, biz business stuff. But, uh, and honestly, I'm, thankful for that like that's the thing like when we talk whether it's for um you know before or after we record an episode of our, of the podcast um armchair mm -hmm. or if it's just when we get together to watch a movie or if it's for example with the project we're working on together when we have story conferences we do end up talking business at some point and every time we do i'm really grateful for that because i'm learning a lot more yeah yeah and that was that was um honestly things that i've um, contemplated over the years. And I know things that, um, uh, that I learned from Jeremy Robinson, mostly when I was doing beta reading for him mm -hmm. a decade ago. And, uh, Jeremy, uh, famously had, um, well, technically three different r release names, two pen names and his real name. And, um, he did it on purpose because he would, he, he would love to write off genre a lot. And he found just in his, his, his research and his wisdom that, um, if you went off genre too far to one side, um, you would alienate your reader base and inevitably the book, the, his books didn't flop. Jeremy's just Jeremy, but he would just notice a significant dip in sales for that specific title. So, um, whether it was like post-apocalyptic stuff or whether it was horror stuff, um, his horror stuff was Jeremy Bishop and his post-apocalyptic stuff was Jeremiah Knight. Mm -hmm. And, um, then there was just the Jeremy Robinson stuff, which, uh, years ago was like action thriller with some like techno thriller sci-fi stuff kind of baked into it. And, um, since then he's kind of veered more towards like hard science fiction, which he's doing great in. Um, mm -hmm. but he did that on purpose cause he, he released a horror novel called torment and, um, under his normal name and it sold well, didn't sell great. And then when he decided to start doing different genres under different pen names, he noticed better sales, yep. uh, you know, but now it was just too hard for him to, um, figure out and too hard to, uh, uh, manage. So he's gone back to just doing the one name. Um, and for him, it's, it, he's got different reasons though, being a New York times bestseller now, um, having some of the best sales in audiobooks and, uh, having a series picked up by Chad Stileski, uh, yep. from John Wick. Um, he's, that's the dream. <laughs> yeah. And, um, which is actually his monster series, which is his Kaiju series, Project Nemesis. Yep. Uh, so having the John Wick guy, <laughs> you know, ch you know, do, ch having Chad it. Wick <laughs> at this point. Oh, it, 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 it actually, do it. that's going to be, be, that's going to be so cool. That yeah. is going to be cool. So, so there, there's different reasons to go back because, you know, with, with his publicity and stuff, you know, having to go back to one name is just going to be better for his brand instead yeah. of having three different brands. But, uh, but yeah, so that was kind of the, the, the reason that we talked was, um, are your creature feature fans going to be receptive to your spy thrillers? And yeah. realistically the answer is no, but. You no. Know. And, and also I, I really don't know if I've got that many hardcore fans as, no, but it's also got... the new authors. It's also the new authors or the new authors, the new readers that find the you new on readers, Facebook. Yeah. yeah, that find you on Amazon and they see the Blood Angel and then they see your your backlist and it's all creature and monster books. Yep. So they it's, might uh, think, a... oh, well, Blood Angel's probably going to have monsters in it. Then I'm not going to, you know. So it makes oh, sense it's... to to separate. So, yes. Yeah, it, it's, yeah, yeah, and that's the thing. And also, I mean, when, when, you know, you spoke to me about this and then I, I kind of talked to my dad about it and, uh, you know, ran, I, I run certain things through him 
past him in regards to the business side of this. No, oh, I do with and, my parents too. I do with my yeah, parents and, just because, yeah. I mean, that's, that's, it's, that's what they're, you know, that's what they're for. for. <laughs> yeah. They're yeah. here for, you know, for advising us, us and, young and the whippersnappers. Thing, yeah. And the thing is when I did, um, when I came up with the RF Blackstone name, um, you know, that's not, that's not my real name. The RF part, part is, and then mm-hmm. I wanted a different name because at that point, for some reason, not even in Mexico, but just the world over, people have trouble spelling pattern. And I went, I know I went into this a bit. I think I went in, into this a bit with a previous interview I did here. But for some reason, you say Blackstone, everyone can remember it easy as pie. Yeah. Um, and also when I, when I started using it um, and I was posting things and that people, people would see the name and they would say, oh, that's a cool name. That's a badass author name. Um, Armando Rose Amelia and Chuck Buddha on their podcast, Armando Method, I posed a question, they read it, and they both said, oh, RF Blackstone. And they, it was a pause, and they went, oh, that sounds like a, a Western name. That's like a gunslinger name. That's a good name. <laughs> and I'm there, <laughs> you know, and, and yeah. it's that thing where Blackstone came from Harry Blackstone, uh, senior and junior, who, who were two of the um, best American um, stage illusionists back in the, um, you know, like 19, early, 19, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. Kind magic, of thing, but, yeah. Yeah. So my dad's my dad was a magician. I like magic too. So that's where that came from. And he was always disappointed that, you know, I didn't use my real name. So when doing this now, talking with him, I um, I'm saying, you know, I'm gonna use my real name. He went, Good. You know, you'll be able to see your real name on a book. And I'm there going, Yeah, that's gonna be fun. <laughs> yeah. No, I yeah. Uh, and and I mean more power know, to you. you yeah, well, that's the thing. Um, and also, it's liberating because, you know, as I was Blackstone writing, while I was writing, I had to, I felt like I had to put on a persona. And that's something that I, I didn't expect. That yeah, doing, I mean, but then... Doing uh, certain things. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. Then you start doing certain things because it's expected of you and not necessarily something you want to do. And Exactly. So yeah. now, doing this, I'm like... I yeah. could, I'm, I can be me. I, I don't need to hide behind anything. I am yeah. this weird, yeah. weirdy, beardy guy. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, so the next, the next question I have, which is uh, basically a lot of what we just talked about, was um, your your work. So your favorite genre to write in, and or well, and uh, books and series. So obviously, with you starting over uh, with a lot of your content in this case. Uh, we've mm-hmm. kind of gone over a lot of your, you know, your genre and stuff, but kind of at least give us a little bit on maybe so your 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 new heroine uh, being uh, Constanzo Akana, uh, yep. so Connie. Um, give us a little bit of background on Connie uh, that is just kind of like an overview of her that isn't like spoiled and whatever. Okay. So just so, you know, yeah. Okay, so um, the first the first book in the Blood Angel series. Um, called the blood angel it takes place all in mexico um and the only reason was because i lived there for five years and uh, it was easy to write (laughs) yeah Yeah. um but also i I met a lot of amazing people with some fantastic names and okana um, Okana was one of the last names of a student of mine when i taught Mm -hmm. english there so connie is um one of the world's top assassins she um when we first meet her she has been out of the game for about seven years something happened in her past where she was presumed dead by the cia so she was able to live a normal life married kids yeah the, the whole yards um and basically her, her um with her she's had one of those lives where it was clear she was going to end up working as an assassin for the cia or whoever her parents, you know, born in a small town in the um, middle of Mexico. Her parents were kidnapped by the cartel and killed. She took to the streets. And she pickpocketed, um, tried to steal from a uh, American businessman who turned out to be working for the CIA. <laughs> gotcha. And he yeah. recruited her and trained her and turned her into this badass, awesome killing machine. Yeah. So when we meet her at the beginning, she's been out of the game for a while and a massive tragedy happens that brings her back in and we get to follow her as she goes on a rampage. She, you know, basically goes through hell and back just to find out who hurt her. And 
yeah, it's fun. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's fun. <laughs> yeah, and that is the Blood Angel book one of the Blood Angel series. Uh, came out a couple weeks ago. And yep. uh, book two in the series, uh, which, Rich, uh, name, and uh, what do we... Yep, I so mean, I, uh, I can say it. I can say no, it. No, sorry. But, sorry, but, no, it's, but no. it's your... I'll be more oh, willing no, no, to no. talk. I'm, I'm not used to... Talk, that's the thing. I'm not used to talking series because this is sure. the first series I've, I've written. Um, sure. Everything I did for... Um, Severed was standalone. So standalone, sorry, yeah, I, they're, I, they're all one I, I, Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so please forgive good. any pauses. So it's called the Hunted. Yep, and it picks up right where the where the first book ends. Um, and I do mean right after. It is like basically you hit the end at book one. You pick up book two. It's right there. It goes off the mark. Yeah, yeah. The, the, um, and, what, I remember you were telling me what you wanted was basically. Uh, the series to at the end of at the end of the story arc, you wanted it just to feel like one huge story. Yes, yeah, yes, and that's, and, and, that's and, the and way that, you were that, putting it together. That came uh, that came about because when I was planning and outlining uh, the story for the Blood Angel, you asked me a question, which was, "What's the big conspiracy?" Because <laughs> <laughs> because originally it literally was just going to be, she's tracking down this hit squad. Mm -hmm. That's all it originally was going to be. It was going to be a very simple revenge story. And you asked me that question and I, I went, Oh hell, I don't know. So I took some time mm -hmm. and I slowly built up the world and everything. And then one yeah. day I sent you a message saying it's going to be this. And you went, Oh, that's cool. So then trying to make it work in one book, going from a small story, that's the blood angel one to what is going to be a big, basically a big epic kind of, world changing sure. thing in one book i couldn't make it work yeah it was just so then much. i yeah. yeah so then i had the idea i'll turn it into a trilogy so this was going to be book one and then you know book two was going to be basically um on the run after the events of book one and she discovers hmm. this ploy and then book three is the original big world changing ending i came up with sure um and I was planning all that. I wanted to get it all planned and all outlined. That way I could just write them one after another. And that wasn't working. <laughs> I was struggling with that middle book. Book book two was terrible to work on. And I was complaining. I don't want to say complaining, but I was talking to you about it. And you said, why not split that into another book? So you've got four books. And it was one of those moments where you said that to me. And I'm thinking, schmuck. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes that's all you need, man. Sometimes you yeah. just need you need you need that other voice to just tell you the obvious, and you go, "Oh yeah." <laughs> but I wasted and, three weeks of my life. <laughs> you know, um, whatever. At, at you that know point, I mean. it was all, at that point it was like a month. <laughs> yeah, mm, yeah. Um. There. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Been there. So I um. So so now we've got the four books, and you know you've got the Blood Angel is book one. The Hunted, which is book two. Book three is The Harbinger. Mm -hmm. And then book four is The Maelstrom. Yeah. Um, so not only are we, you know, and it is, when you read the four books, it is one epic story. Cool, cool. Um, so, you know, if you're wanting an om the uh, omnibus edition for your bookshelf, yeah, I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> uh... Not a physical. <laughs> It could happen. It would probably just be very small words. <laughs> <laughs> the font would have to be a little tiny for it to fit in between uh, yeah. two dense pieces of cardboard. Yes, so, because because so far the books have been a little bit on the chunky side. <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, chunky is is putting it lightly, but yes, they have been on the chunky side. But hey, uh, that is the one thing with stories like this is they are expected to be chunky. Uh, well, that, that's it. That's this kind it. of that's genre um, is expected to be kind of bigger. Where the creature feature books, I mean, you, you told me plenty of times. I mean, a lot of them are thirty, forty, fifty thousand words. Yeah. You know, they're they're quick, they're light, they're boom, get them out, done. And then it, it's, it's popcorn reading. Yeah, yeah. You're supposed to sit there and read it in a, in a day or two and be done. Yeah. Like that's, yeah, that's kind it. of the idea. Um, and I mean, I, I when I when I started to get you know realize I wanted to write this stuff next, I devoured books i read so many books mm -hmm. and all of them all these thrillers were read it were chunky They're monkeys huge. yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah um, they all averaged only... more than a hundred thousand words 
Yeah, there was only yeah. one that I read that was probably less than a, that was probably less than one like about one hundred thousand, and that was um the cleaner, the cleaner, no, not the cleaner. Oh, I don't remember the name, but it was a Craig Martell. This is the first first book in Craig Martell's Hitman oh, yeah, series. Yeah. Yeah, and I and I did not enjoy it. Not because of the length; the length didn't matter. I just didn't enjoy the story, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, everything else is these big books, and that's not that wasn't a problem for me. Um, yeah, developing the world takes time, and it takes pages. Yeah, and yeah. when you're writing a book set in Mexico, um, specifically two parts of Mexico, Guanajuato City and Mexico City, which not a lot of people would have been to, you've got to take extra time in setting up that world and that culture a bit more. Sure. Um, and then with uh, The Hunted, with book two, you know, we're in Italy. So we're going between Florence and Siena. So building up all of that. Yeah. You know, that... Um, the Hunted is longer than The Blood Angel by about 7,000, almost 8,000 words. <laughs> yeah. But right. granted, that was because I got into a rhythm and I was having so much more fun. <laughs> yeah. No, and that's, that's man, I did that with The Undying Kingdom with Jack Riley 4, where, um, which is to date my the longest book I've, I've put together. And mm-hmm. I remember writing that and... I think probably messaging you while I was doing it. And I'm like, yeah, I'm not even close to being done. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I'm like, this book just keeps getting bigger. I'm like, I keep Which... finding cool things to add at the end and to like just extend the story even more without it feeling like I'm just padding the story. And I was like, yeah, this book's just getting bigger because it's there's so much cool stuff to include and I don't want to I don't want to cheapen it by cutting it out. So and, and or I don't want to feel that's... like I'm cheapening at least my experience writing it by cutting it out. Yeah. But and that's the great thing about what we do. I mean, mm-hmm. where we we write something and we start to have a lot of fun and we want to keep adding more. We want it, we don't want it to end. The great yeah. thing about what we do is that when we're editing the book, if we get to those sections and we're like, okay, it, it's dragging out, it's making it too long, we can cut it yeah. and we can save it for another book. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's basically the Spielbergian way of of writing books at this point. Yeah. Because, you know, We've, we, we talked on our other uh, podcast several times, uh, the famous coat hanger scene from Raiders of the Lost Ark, where, you know, it's got this torture device that he ends up yep. turning into a coat hanger. Spielberg tried to work that into two movies before Raiders, and it just, the gag just didn't work. And he just put it on the back, and you watch this in the making of the movie, he talks about it. He goes, I've been trying to figure out a movie to put this in, and I couldn't and figure it out. And then it finally, works it works perfectly. And that's all it was. It was a back burner moment. Or the um, the tank chase in Last Crusade, you yep. know, and there that was in a different script. That was this. That was, and then um, th- there's so many scenes that are just held on to that. I'll just figure out another. I mean, I've done yeah. it. I can't tell you how many times where I've set up a scene and I'm like, jot it down and go and put it, bit. Wait, and then you well, use it in it. the next book. I- you know, I've had certain ideas for for characters or even mm-hmm. a plot, and I'm like, yep. And I keep trying to use it. It's like, well, I can't use it. It's not going to fit in this and this. And yeah, you get to that point. You're like, you know what? I've got, I think I've got it. I think I know where I can fit in. Dude, which is I've great. Written, I've written an entire books based on something that I see that I want to write about, but it doesn't fit what I'm currently writing about. So I literally yep. just <laughs> save the bookmark and then I open it up and an entire 90,000 word book comes out of th- something I saw because of, I really wanted to write about it or I tried to include it into this, but like with, with, you know, with a lot of my books and like what you're doing with different locations, uh, it has to make sense based on where your characters are. So, yeah. and you know, if your book's in Mexico, your book's in Italy, and then you read something and it's like Mongolia and you're like, damn, Connie's got to get to Mongolia. <laughs> <laughs> You know what I mean? It's like something like that yeah. where you're like, you really want to write about oh. that, but you have to figure out a way for it to work. Oh, and, I, I, and I know for a fact it, I'm going to make it work. <laughs> well, yeah. I'm going to make it work and somehow. That's it. You've just got to, yeah. you've got to either, you know, perform a lot of uh, flips and twists to get it to work or mm-hmm. you go, right, you know, what? not this story, we'll save it for another one. And that's the thing. Um, I, I like doing the research for, um, you know, our, our collaboration, Alex Wake. Yeah there are things that I've discovered and I'm like, Oh man, you know, in regards to the art world, I'm like, Oh man, I want to write about that, but yeah. I can't because it doesn't fit with what we're doing. Yeah. 
And so I'm like, okay, you know what? That's more in line with this other character that I pitched to you guys, Joseph Bell. And I'm like, mm-hmm. that's per- that's right up his alley. <laughs> you know, it's that, you know. That's oh, yeah. I mean, I've pulled books from other series is because I think it's going to work better with a different leading character. And well, yeah, we, and I've done it. You, I mean, I, yeah, I, you've I, talked to me about We've talked about yeah, that. Yeah, I've talked about you know, it. I, I, that's the thing. I think what we're doing specifically with what we're, the genres we're writing in, you know, mm-hmm. we do action adventure, I'm doing action thriller. I think we do get a lot more freedom than say people who are writing horror creature features, even romance or mm-hmm. um, sci-fi fantasy. I think we do have that freedom because we can, no matter what we, what we're researching or what we're writing, we know yeah. if it doesn't fit here, it will definitely fit in another book. Yeah. And that's where you have to, you also have to be open to starting over. Which starting yeah. over meaning like new series, new characters, new this, new that. I mean, I, I'm doing that right now, like weirdly starting uh, three, yeah, three, <laughs> three new series this year. Three, three. Uh, ah, yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Zara. Yeah, it's three. Alex, oh. and then later this year. Oh no, four. No, Zara, not Zara. Sorry, Relics. Oh. Relics, Alex, Alex and, and then, yeah, later sorry. this year, Ryan Quinn. So I'm starting three new series this year uh, based on content that I want to produce that doesn't work with existing characters. And But I want to write about that world. And, you know, say two, three years ago, three, four years ago, I would just have a folder in my Dropbox sitting there with all this stuff and staring at it going, why can't I use you? This sucks because... I could I can picture this epic story in my head, but it just doesn't fit. And then mm-hmm. you know you and I you know we have schedules that we we try to keep up with with, so we can just kind of plan our future. And you know you plan your schedule and go okay I have this series I have this series I'm like well this amazing idea over here on my right screen. 2017 or 2027 is the first time I'm going to be able to touch it. 2026, just based on all of this other stuff I'm writing. If I'm holding to my current subject matter yes and that's just not good enough that's not that's not acceptable in my eyes i'm like if i need to write this i want to that's that's where try to get uh, yeah try to well, get as soon where, as possible that's where alex wake was born so uh, i i i know i i still love i love the fact that you know you told me about this character yeah. you shown me um a, the prologue you'd written you showed me all the stuff you had even shown me covers you created and then Maybe, yeah. you know, you talk to me about it every now and then. And then one day I wake up to a message from you because, you know, time zones are wonderful. Thing. Yeah. Because I've depending, well, no, depending on which of our countries is going through daylight savings, it's either 14 or 16 hours <laughs> difference. Yeah. But it's, that, it's that sort of thing where I, <laughs> yeah. It but, is. You know, it really it, is. Been, I remember been, we finished daylight savings. It went to 15 hours. Yeah. And then, then you finished I, daylight savings and it went to 14 hours. And yeah. I'm like, wait, what? I thought we, uh, I thought we already it, got rid of this, and then three weeks later it changed again, or whatever it ended up happening. Two weeks later, oh yeah, it's it, it yeah. In that regards, it's terrible. But you know, I've woken up to messages from you. Oh man, and it, yeah, I've you sent know, like, you so many messages. Up, I'm like, I know Rich is dead asleep, but I have to. Say oh yeah, because I'm going to. I love it because I wake up and it's either, for example, it's either, you know, I wake up to an email from you with a contract, and then a message yeah. from you at the same time saying sent the contract, or I wake up to a cover and a what do you think, or yeah. I wake up to. You know, a message that says, okay, this is a long message. It's a lot for you to think, to, to think about. And I'm like, oh, this is going to be interesting. And it's you asking me to co-write Alex Wake with you. Yeah. And I start, and I'm scrolling through it. And the moment you get to the part where you're like, you know, because you're explaining your, you know, you're not going to get it for years to come. You really want to write it. And then it says, so, you know, do you want to? I didn't read anything after that. I easily scrolled down and said, yes. <laughs> yeah, because that was my... My want to do something more action thriller, uh, a character that still has a little snark to him, but a character yep. that can go, that can switch it on and get real nasty when he needs to. Um, but um, basically what we ended up settling on was a 90s Bruce Willis. Um, mid-90s Bruce Willis. Mid-90s Prime Bruce, Bruce Willis. Willis. Prime Bruce die Willis. Prime Bruce Willis. Die Hard, Vengeance. Fifth Element. Uh, yeah, yep, yeah, that's... yeah. Chef's so, kids, Bruce Willis. <laughs> yeah, what, not the look, but the 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 personality, the personality. The, and yeah. and just the all hell breaks loose shenanigans that he finds himself in. Yeah. Um. But he's going to be you know, uh, ex CIA operative type of stuff and uh, a lot of world travel. Because the first thing I told Rich when I pitched him this idea was, 
I have all of these locations and all of these really cool things I'd love to write about, but I have no idea how I'm going to do this yep. or when I'm going to be able to like time wise. And, um, when you're writing the action adventure stuff and all your stories are more based on like historical stuff, whether it's artifacts or whether it's like lost cities or this, or whatever, um, you get to certain parts of the world where there's really not a lot of um, substance to really hold that type of story. Yep. But an action thriller, a straightforward action thriller, you can do anything in those areas and those locations. So I'm just like, well, that would be cool. But I'm like, then I look at my schedule and go, okay, well, 2026. Rich is fast. <laughs> he's, a, he's a quick keyboardist. Yeah. So and, uh, well, that's it. And I mean, and I'm when like, you, when you do this, I'm like, yeah, because I really want to help produce these stories. I just don't have a lot of time to do all of the writing on my own um, without it affecting the other stories that I've yeah. promised myself to write. And I'm just like, okay, well, here we are. So, <laughs> but that's the thing. I mean, when you when you when you um, approached me and I said yes, I then looked at my schedule because my schedule at that point was the four Blood Angel books. Mm -hmm. Then it was going to be um, the Spy Time Loop book. Mm -hmm. And then I had the principal and uh, that principal rewrite. And then there was, that was really bad because I hadn't really, I hadn't pitched anything. Yeah, because you else. were just kind of resetting your schedule. Yeah. And, yeah. and when you, and you know, we, and I said yes to you and I looked at my schedule and went, okay, I, I can definitely slide it in. That's not a problem. And then you said to me, we're going to do it for, we're going to do the um, release date. It's going to be for this, we're going to release it this month. Is that more than enough time? Because I was beginning to work on The Hunted. And, you know, I'm, I, I, you know, I'm fast and I'm an idiot. And I looked at, looked at the, you know, time, how long it takes me to do things in schedule and all that. And I just went, yeah, you know, I always say yes. And then try to figure out how to make it work. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that's the movie industry talking. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, that, that is you, it. you never yeah, say no. You don't say yeah, no. no. You never say no. Um, never say you always no. say yes. And then you try to make it all work. And luckily, you know, because we're in contact so much, figuring out everything with Alex Wake yeah. made it simpler, you know, mm -hmm. and book length, you know, it's a shorter book. It's about 80, it's going to be 85,000 words. So it's a lot shorter than what we've been writing yeah. recently. So that fact alone, you know, with how fast I write, I realized it will take me literally two and maybe two and a half weeks, three weeks top to write this book. Yeah. And so I'm like, yep, more than enough time. Thinking, yep, I'll have time. And then I'm writing book two of, uh, I'm writing The Hunted and I'm there going, yep, I've got time. I've got time. Finish that, start doing the editing. And editing, I'm a little slow with at times with editing because I don't like it that much. <laughs> None of us do. Uh, I, know, I, I know some people who think editing is the best part because according to them, that's when you can form the story you can create the story you can get all you can talk about it in wanky ways <laughs> no no by um, the, the editing process i don't want to go through my book that many times well see that's the thing i I've, like... i i i when it came to editing i've i that yeah, i discovered a new technique and it's basically this you write the book then you export the book if you, and read it now you can print it if you want but who's going to pay it to print off yeah, 400 or pages so i export it to my kindle and then i'll sit down and i'll read it in, in as many little sittings as i can yeah and then after that i will let that all percolate and then i'll sit down and say what did i like what didn't i like and the stuff that i don't like that i didn't like off the top of that list that's the stuff i'll fix right then and there sure so we've um with the blood angel um when i did that that was the first book I tried this technique of it and on it just sped everything up because I was able to go through and it was things like, okay, I didn't like a couple of the, um, like a couple of sequences I didn't like. So I, they were towards the end of the book. So I could just focus on those. And it's just, instead of going from chapter one all the way to end the chapter to the final chapter, you're targeting those problem areas. Yeah. And it sped up the process. I enjoyed it. So I did it again with the hunted. And, you know, I'm reading it going, great. I've, I'm checking my schedule to make sure I've got more than enough time to do the editing and then start Alex. Mm -hmm. And I realized, oh, yeah, I'm going to have to do some rewriting. Sent you a message saying, yep, books, books, you know, books almost finished. Just doing my read through. Yeah, I'm 
going to do some rewriting. Don't worry, we're still on, still on track. And, you know, Mr. Late back here, you've just gone, yeah, whatever. <laughs> just when we, you know, just get it done. Details, details. Don't bother me with the details <laughs> kind of thing. Yeah. Well, I, I, I try to live by the mantra of Mr. Mizrani from Jurassic World and, you know. <laughs> The only something about uh, you only you only start to live when you uh, when you figure when out you that truly you truly let go, or when you truly realize you're never in control. Yeah. So it's but one see, of those I, things where I there's nothing I can really say that's gonna be like other than yeah okay guys I'm just not <laughs> I just oh yeah but, I don't have control over it anyway so why. <laughs> But see, for me, it's a case of I'm letting you know because yeah. since the next book I'm writing is Alex, I want, I'm letting you know that this is going to this is what's happening on my end. Just so you know, yeah, I can yeah. say yeah, it's going to take. I, I'm yeah, still on always, track to do everything. So yeah, but, um, yeah. Um, and cool. so you know, the rewrite I had to do on the hunted, it literally was the villain, everything to do with the villain, the villain's motivation, everything. I ha I didn't like. <laughs> I'm thinking, okay, everything of Connie works great. The villain sucked, and now that no, you know, it's one of the things. Some people would say, "Well, if your villain sucks, then the rest of the book is going to be terrible because your, you know, story is only good as your villain." Yeah, you know, that's and and I went no, and I'm thinking, well, yeah, no, that's true. But for me, the villain's motivation didn't make sense. Everything that they're doing, you know, it was like ten about twenty chapters. Twenty chapters out of about ninety-five chapters, I had to rewrite. It was easy once I crack that yeah. you know and then back into re, you know do do that rewrite export it reread it and then you know start doing line editing and that's where i really hate i hate line editing yeah that's that's rough and and this is one of those cases where i was i was glad for uh pro writing aid because it, it tackled all the problems i you know yeah. i go through and I'm going to, and I do this with every book. I always get to a point with the book where I feel that if I keep going with editing, I'm going to screw it up. I'm going to mess up the book. If I keep going with editing, I always get that feel, this feeling. And I've never ignored it. Like, no, tell a lie. I ignored it once and the book did turn out bad. <laughs> so I got to that point the other day and I went, right, that's it. I'm done. You know, I just quickly double checked a couple of things, made sure continuity was okay. Then I sent it. I sent it off to you. Um, and, you know, and, and, I, and um, I know we were talking about, you know, Connie and Blood Angel and with the hunted, because it takes place in Italy, Connie ends up getting hunted by the Italian mafia for a hit she, a uh, botched hit she did when she was still working for the CIA way back when. Um. You know, which it's a chase story. Yeah. Prop that's it's a, a that's a proper name then, the hunted. What? It being called the hunted is a proper name then because it's a chase story. She's being yeah, hunted. Yeah, that's so the thing. As, as, just as, a clever as, name. It's it's no, as great. we're talking, I'm thinking, she probably yeah, keep calling it the hunted and listeners are probably going, Why? Give us a bit more. Come on, Chuckles. <laughs> no, no. It, but that's you have to find out. Yeah, you got to buy the book. Yeah, buy the book. So, uh, you know, yeah, that's um, scheduled for release uh, late May, end of May. Um, and uh, we uh, actually just got the finished cover back uh, today. Oh, it looks good. It looks good. Yeah, it looks good. That'll, um, that'll uh, as of recording this, because um, we love dating um, shows on all of my podcasts between Real Life Fiction and Armchair Directors. Uh, but you know, we always talk current because, you know, I want to know what the authors are doing on this podcast anyways. I want to know hmm. what they're doing and, and promote the work and stuff. But, uh, uh, book two in the blood angel series, uh, will be getting up for pre-order, um, anytime. So now that we have, <laughs> no, I mean, now that we have the, the cover finished and stuff, cover, yeah. uh, we'll be able to get it up on, uh, get it up on Amazon for pre-order. Um, just there's a few other bells and whistles that need to be kind of looked at before uh before it gets up there but uh it, it'll go on pre-order shortly so just keep looking for it on amazon um, anybody that's interested but um so off, don't call off, me shortly no I, I didn't call you Shirley, anyways so that that was why not <laughs> surely you just surely you just um so uh <laughs> no but to kind of move off and kind of go towards yeah. uh what we had 
talked uh, earlier was um, your influences. So as the yes. action thriller author, um, obviously, depending on genres and stuff, your, your answers can change because of yes. the content you're producing. But um, action thriller, we did, obviously, we, we, we talked to Bond, and if anybody has listened to our Armchair Directors podcast, uh, our GoldenEye episode, our James Bond episode, still our longest episode to date, over three hours long. Uh, that was supposed to be GoldenEye, but then we kind of also decided to just do a kind of broad James Bond discussion, which was yeah. a great episode. But uh, I, I know that's something that you grew up watching, you know, your dad's loved. Um, and then you mentioned Mission Impossible. Um, yep. But um, I always like to know, like, where did, like, the fascination with, I guess, like, the spies and stuff, like, wh where, because, like, like, with me, it was, you know, like, I grew up watching the, you know, the, the, the Connery and Roger Moore James Bonds, because that's what yep. was on, like, AMC, would have 24 hours of Bond and just have all these movies on. My dad loved them. Um, but, uh, so I just grew up watching them, so they're always a part of my childhood. And then Indiana Jones was a huge part of my childhood. Mummy 99, yep. you know, I was 14 when that came out. And uh, that was just like, or perfect 15. Age. Oh, yeah, perfect age for that. So it was like certain things where they just, it's the timing of it when it comes out. And you just get enthralled with it. And I just loved the idea of like the world travel. And I love history. Ancient history, history in general for me has always been a love of mine. Going out of my way and reading research books on stuff just because I think it's it's cool. I just think it's neat. Uh, mostly because the U.S., our history is very short, you know, being yep. a country since in the 1700s. So reading about all these other countries that have history dating back, you know, you know, two and three thousand years B.C., you're just like, yeah, I, I can't I don't like fathom it as an American because our history just doesn't go that far back. You know, our American history, not I, not, I, like, I, not I, like Native American, but just like our our country's yeah. history. I understand that because when I was in Mexico teaching, you know, Australia is saying we're a young country as well. And mm -hmm. You know, I have students ask about, you know, Australian history and I'd be like, well, I can sum it up in less than five minutes and I would. And you could just see them be so disappointed. Yeah. <laughs> you know, whereas, go, you know, going, being in Mexico, going, learning well, about, yeah. you know, the Aztecs, the Mayans, the Olmecs, the Tolmecs, the whole, all that, then the Spanish conquest. It's incredible. Yeah. So, so I, I, I understand completely. And then you try to figure out what Montezuma's revenge really was. Oh yeah, I did experience it. <laughs> Besides drinking the water, no, it wasn't the water. It was some food. I it was some food. Yeah. It was actually, um, it was funny. Usually, you get you get the revenge when you, your first time there. For me, yeah, it as came, your body acclimates and stuff. Yeah, yeah, but for me, I got it. Um, what was it? I, got, I had it. I got it twice. The first time was back in twenty eighteen. Yeah, it was twenty eighteen. I gone to teach and the student took me to a um, little uh, restaurant near where he worked to have food to do the class there and I tried something new something I'd never had before and on the long long like subway ride home <laughs> it hit me oh geez and it was one of those things where I'm looking at the next stop going okay do I know that stop do I know what's above it is there a t place I can use a toilet close am I gonna make it <laughs> <laughs> well good news is a lot of a lot of the subway stations in in the u.s they are essentially a toilet so yeah but, but not 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 so. the Me not, not mexico city subway because no. that's the thing mexico city has a population it's that's almost the same size as australia yeah yeah you, you were telling me mexico city yeah so yeah the uh, the the metro the, the subway there yeah it, it's 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 packed so you're not gonna drop drop trout there no <laughs> um okay so for me, <laughs> it actually goes to Quinn Tarantino. He's the man to blame. Oh, okay. So when I was, you know, uh, like 15, 16 years old, I started to, you know, get into wanting to make movies. I started learning everything about movies. And of course, you know, at that age, not old enough to see his stuff. Yeah. But learning about him, and you know his his history, and then learning about Robert Rodriguez, because I'd yep. seen Desperado, and yep. learning about you know his his no budget filmmaking, and learning about Kevin Smith, it got me into it. And then I think I was like sixteen or seventeen years old, I think seventeen, for my birthday, Mum and Dad gave me a bunch of Quentin Tarantino movies oh, on DVD cool. to watch. 
Reservoir Dogs, the whole thing. I'd, yeah. I'd, and I'd seen bits and pieces of Pulp Fiction. So that what happened was that got me into it, like from dusk till dawn, that movie. Yeah. I loved from dusk till dawn because it's like 30 Gecko. minutes to an hour. Gecko of, Brothers, yeah. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's 30 minutes to an hour of a hardcore crime film. And then at the midway point, it turns into this bonkers vampire movie. Yeah. And it was such an odd uh, combination of actors in that movie, but it worked so well. Yes. Because you're thinking and, and George that's... Clooney with that <laughs> full arm tattoo. Tattoo. Yeah. The And then Harvey Keitel just being, I mean, I mean that makes sense just because of his history with Quentin. Yeah. But, but then you've got Juliette Lewis. You've got yeah. um, Danny Trejo in cameo, Selma Hayek, Tom Savini. Um, Mm-hmm. Quinton Quinton to himself, but that 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 opening that first half the crime stuff really got to me, and then I yeah. started watching other crime movies, so The Godfather's, Goodfellas, um, you know Heat, all that sort of stuff, and then I start then I got into British crime movies, sure. so not even Guy Ritchie's Snatch, Lock, Sock, and all that, not even that, like The Long um, Good Friday with Bob Hoskins, like some proper serious British crime flicks. Mm-hmm. All the while, I'm still watching Bond and all mm-hmm. that sort of stuff. That's still there, but I'm I'm watching all this crime stuff. And then it was um, there was a spy movie, The Tailor of Panama. That was it. Oh, nice. Yeah, Pierce. <laughs> the, the Tailor of Panama. I saw that. I I'd heard about it. You know, and it's Jeffrey Rush, who I'm a fan of. I, I, yeah, I like Jeffrey Rush. It's Jamie Lee Curtis, and it's. Um, Piers Brosnan, it's James Bond himself doing a spy movie set in Panama. I'm like, okay, I've got to, I've got to watch this, and it was great. It blew my mind because you know, Piers Brosnan's playing the spy. You know, he's a spy for MI6, and he is not a nice person. He, he he's out for himself. He is disgusting. He's loathsome. Yeah, yeah, he's and a he's, scumbag. Yeah, and he and he did this between Tomorrow Never Dies and was it Tomorrow The World Never is Dies Not Enough? What is not enough? I think it was yeah. between those two movies. World isn't, yeah, that's movie that's two and three. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'm pretty sure he did that between them. Um, you know, he's having a blast playing it, and that got me in. That got me thinking more about spies. Mm-hmm. And you know, then you had Daniel Craig's. Daniel Craig comes out as Bond. Bond. Yep. You get um. You know, you 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 also. Yeah, I, I was watching the Mission Impossible's the first Mission Impossible from Brian De Palma. It was a little too slow for my taste at the time because i wanted sure. more action yeah then you had john woo come in and really amp up the action <laughs> yeah, that was uh the second one right mission possible too yep. yeah. yeah yeah which that's that's the one set in australia mm-hmm. and you had then mission possible 3 with jj abrams and philip seymour hoffman as the yeah. villain yep. which i've never appreciated it <laughs> until relatively recently and it was these sort of movies where it was more the action side of things that i was really enjoying and then you know watching taylor of panama and going okay there is more to the spy stuff than just this so i was then sure. watching other spy spy um movies and other spy shows and then what really helped cement it was the 2011 adaptation of tinker taylor soldier spy with gary oldman as george smiley oh nice i watched it didn't know anything about the book you know i knew I had heard of John Lecair and all that, but I watched that movie and I was, I, that was incredible. Then as I always do, when I discover something I really enjoy, I go down the rabbit hole to find yeah. out everything I can. And I learned about, there was the series done in the seventies with Atta Guinness as Smiley. So I watched, I, I got a copy of it and I watched it and it's incredible. I then read the book and the book was boring as hell. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the book is not always better. <laughs> no, um, but it was that thing, and I started to watch a bunch of other John Le Carre adaptations because it's yeah, that but if you had John... read the book first, the movie would be like bonkers and all. This is this, yeah, yeah, know. yeah, because they they have either. to cut so much out. Yeah, and yeah. that was the, that was the good thing about the um, read, you know, watching the the series done by the BBC in the eighties, uh, late seventies, was because I watched that, which is much more comprehensive than the movie, mm-hmm. and then reading the book is like okay. You know, you kind of see what they, you understand what they have to cut out. It's just the book is boring for some reason. Gotcha. And in the in the spy literary world, the great debate is, you know, who's better, Ian Fleming, like, or John Le Care? 
And it's one of those things. I watched a bunch of John Le Care adaptations. So The Spy Who Came In From The Cold with Richard Burton, which is a great movie. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, um, A Most Wanted Man, um, the uh, the Night Manager miniseries. That, that's, that, that, that's, an inf- that's influenced me a bit with certain things I'm going to be doing in um, uh, The Blood Angel Book 3. Um, and the more I learn about spies, like I started reading nonfiction stuff a lot, and the more you learn about spy and spy craft and exactly what it is, you kind of begin to understand that, okay, Ian Fleming, who did work at, um, you know, during World War II, he was part of Operation Mincemeat, which was a spy plan to mm-hmm. fool the Nazis and all this. And he took some of what he experienced and what he learned and put it into James Bond. And John Le Care, same thing. He worked at MI6 for a long time before yeah. he had enough and started writing his spy books. But it's one of those things where we talked about it earlier with the creature feature stuff. Creature feature books are popcorn. That's popcorn entertainment. That's popcorn reading. That's what James Bond is. It is pure entertainment. Yeah. Whereas John Le Care, he gives you the real world version. So instead of it being the globe tropping globe trotting um, womanizer you know handsome debonair sophisticated mm-hmm. always knows what to say always knows what to do spy he gives you these realistic characters who are sad sacks who are emotionally broken men they are not nice people yeah it's kind of like op- that's what tom clancy did you know tom clancy gave yeah. you the education of a lifetime and like that dense uh that dense universe of stuff because of his background in the military and, you know, it's like I was always a huge fan of all of his, you know, like the video games and the movies and stuff. Mm-hmm. But you start getting into the books and you really need to be prepared for the information dump of a lifetime yep. because but that's just what he provides. And it's like, you know, there's other authors that don't. If you just want strict entertainment, then there's other yeah. authors that do that. But, you know, for me, anyways, Clancy was the ultimate educator uh, within his stories. And you just had to hold on. Because that's where you start getting into some very, I don't want to say long-winded, because it it, it wasn't, but it was like chapters information, long. Information dumps. Yeah, and it's like forever, and you just have to kind of get through it, and then it's like, okay, here we go. Because like Rainbow Six was always one of my favorite video game franchises growing up. Oh, and but the books, when, the book is a, is, is a monster. <laughs> yeah, when I discovered the book, I'm like, oh, it's a book. That's cool. And I'm like, oh, well, I like this series. So I'm, I just thought that that would be a really cool introduction into this world. And when I saw the book, I'm like, oh, my. I'm like, I could build a house with it. You know, it's a uh, brick. It's a literal brick. And I was like, yep. oh. And then I'm reading the first, like, six pages in the bookstore, just trying to, like, and I didn't understand any of it. It was all just, like, military weapon like flight this whatever it was all of this like tech stuff from and i'm like uh <laughs> i'm like uh now i'm like really confused i'm like uh, um okay and, and then what does it have to do with the story now that's the other <laughs> well yeah but the problem is is now i'm like did i miss something or mm-hmm. like now i start reading the story and go I didn't retain any of the information from the first few chapters. And I'm like, uh, uh, not my thing, not my thing. So, uh, yep. Yeah, no, I, I, that's the thing. As far as the book that's is concerned. Jo- yeah. and, and that's John Le Care in yeah. regards to Spy. Like he, he, his, his version of action is actually a very tense moment between two characters having a conversation. Kind of think of like the opening of Inglorious Bastards. Yeah. With Lander going to the milk farm. It's basically that sort of thing. So there's actually very few fist fights, very few gunfights, very few explosions because it's all supposed to be real world spy craft, which is not glamorous. <laughs> no. Um, so yeah. so you know, getting, looking at all that, I then read a book um, called "The Spy and the Traitor," which is about a Russian double agent mm-hmm. during the Cold War. He was KGB. He got posted. He got recruited by MI6, and for about thirty odd years, he was feeding MI6 all this information. And reading that was an, inc- you know, true story. Reading that was incredible. It was, it was, a, it was amazing. Um, and when I, you know, like a lot of the things I like to watch and read, yeah, there's the action adventure stuff. That's, that's always going to be there. But 
you know, I really do enjoy a good spy movie and also a, cr- a, cr- a good crime flick, like a good heist. Yeah. Hell yeah, because one of the... Um, one know, of my favorites uh, growing up was the remake of The Thomas Crown Affair. I mean, uh-huh. with Pierce. I mean, that was yeah. such a great classic heist movie. And then it, uh, it what was the other one? The um, It was kind of a heist movie. Yeah, uh, The Italian Job. Yeah, that's uh, a heist movie. Yeah, with yeah. Uh, Marky Mark. Yeah, with Marky Mark. Uh, that was a cool one because then they they had that great yep. car chase in there. Um, yeah, with the minis. Yeah, with the minis. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was that was cool. Yeah, and uh, there was one more. I think it may have been another another painting, maybe or another or another museum, something. I can't remember what it was. Obviously, the Ocean's Eleven. Oh, <laughs> uh, well, the original Ocean's Eleven. Yeah, I mean, the, you know, with the Rat Pack, that was yep. that was fun. I um, like, was, yeah. was there, the other thing that really influenced me as a kid, and I did see it when I was a lot younger, like when I was about 10, 12 years mm-hmm. old, the um, castle of Cagliostro, which is um, a early Hayao Miyazaki movie, which is a um, adapt, which is um, part of the Lupin the Third um, series mm-hmm. of uh, anime and manga, which is, he's a gentleman thief. That's that was a big influence too on just fun, a rompy adventure caper kind of sure. thing. Um, you know yeah. that that that's that's yeah. basically how I got there. <laughs> basically, I'm probably oh, missing yeah. a couple of things, but um, yeah. but the other things that really kind of helped drive me to go more into writing thrillers than anything else. There are two master classes that I watch because. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, we're always trying to better ourselves. We're always trying oh, yeah. to improve and what we do. Who, and who, who better to look at than the biggest guys in the industry? Well, that's it. And I was looking at the um the masterclass, and okay, you know, there's James Patterson, there's R.L. Stein, Neil Gaiman, and I'm like, okay, cool, you know. Then I saw David Baldacci and Dan Brown, and yeah. I kind of went, okay, I got to watch those. And I watched the David Baldacci, and a lot of things that I was doing already he talks about him he does himself but there are a couple of things in regards to writing itself and like setting up the plot um certain things like that where I I I, t- I took copious notes and he's a very big fan of having shorter chapters yeah and coming from a script writing um background where you can't you don't use a lot of um, description because you can't it's more dialogue and more action focus my, most of my all my stuff is like that so i started incorporating that you know his stuff more his style and things he talked about i started bringing that more into my writing and then watching dan brown you know the dan brown master class he's a very very enthusiastic little fella i got so much from there in regards to research yeah, he um, in character he goes, creation. Yeah, he goes very deep on research and character. Yeah, creation. yeah. And then I read the Terminal List. Mm-hmm. Um, now I'd watched the the Amazon series. Yeah, with Chris Pratt, and I was talking about it with another friend of mine. And he said, "Have you read the book?" And I said, "No." He goes, "Read the book. Read the book. The book's awesome." And I got a copy of the book and I read it, and I'm reading, going, "Okay, these chapters are these are short chapters, but they're dense. There are moments that where Jack Carr gives you." all this background information or all this technical stuff. But unlike Tom Clancy, where it's a full chapter, he does it in a very succinct way. Mm -hmm. And I'm reading this going, that is always something I've kind of struggled with. It is these sort of moments where you, you know, because usually you kind of start writing this technical stuff or if you need to explain a city or if you need to explain some yeah. government thing or anything like that, you, you yeah, go you on and your on character and on. in a new location and you, you need to yep. set up the new location yep and you can yeah. go on paragraphs oh yeah and so i start forever and so i did i you know reading jack Carr, I'm like okay he does it this way i can do that i can incorporate that into my shorter chapters and so there's a lot of things out there that that do influence me um don winslow hell i can't believe i've got to talk about him um, he, he, him and James Elroy, but Don Winslow, his book Savages, which the movie is based on, that is that's a, that's like reading a jazz album. <laughs> yeah. Like seriously, because you can get like literally the first chapter is literally just two words, and it's someone telling the reader to go f themselves. <laughs> <laughs> that's the first chapter, and there are you know I'm like that's incredible. Then the next chapter 
explains what you've just read and then it has moments where very important things happen he writes it like a script or then you know you'll finish the chapter you'll turn to the next chapter which can say then we traveled to wherever they're going and then the next chapter they're in the location and i'm reading this going this is incredible he's breaking every rule out there yeah and the, so when I was in Mexico for the very first time in 2014, I, I'd read it. And I was like, I want to write something like this. So I started writing a book about a Mexican cartel. And I was doing that. And I found it re- relatively recently. I started reading and going, oh, this is terrible. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. Um, I know you're also, uh, you're like me, um, and actually probably the entire generation, uh, really kind of probably starting with us just because the technology is video games. Oh, um, yes. Because now I say our generation because, you know, say the last 10 or 15 years. So st- say starting in our, because uh, I'm, I'm 38 and you're 36. So yep. early 20s, say, mm-hmm. when the games started becoming stories. Yeah. And you started getting, you know, the newer Metal Gear Solid games. You started getting eventually your Uncharted games. You started uh-huh. getting all of these mocap suits, you know, all of these actual like live action acted games. Yes. Or these math, like Metal Gear Solid is famous for it. These cutscenes that are 45 minutes long, like these mini yep. movies, especially in like Gun of the Patriot. They have a, a cutscene that I think is literally almost 40 minutes. It's 45. Yeah, it's 45. Yeah, you know yeah. exactly what I'm talking about. It's the the cutscene that leads up to the final. And yep. it's like you're 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 just like and I don't care. I have the controller in my hand and I'm sitting here watching this for 45 minutes. I haven't put the controller down cuz I don't know when it's going to pop in. Yeah, that was but I don't, that's but, the, I, that's but, I, the, but I but I don't care. That's, you know? that's the incredible thing about Konami. Yeah. Uh sorry, Kojima. He he you know cuz yeah, there's no way to tell when it ends. Yeah, you've no. got to be on your you got to keep hold of that controller instead of just putting it down, sitting back and just watching it. (laughs) Yeah. And to me, that's the ultimate medium is because, you know, you and I are writers. So that's the story, the story development. Um, Then you have the actors, Mm -hmm. but then you also have visual production, but then you also have gameplay. Yep. And that's where the gameplay is the ultimate interaction with the fan base where now you and I, I mean, cause we, because we've played the game so much, you know, we'll just watch the cutscene movies because we've yeah. at least experienced the game. And, you know, now you don't have to play through the game to experience the story anymore, which I like cause sitting and playing through an entire game that could take umpteen amount of hours. I just, mm-hmm. you know, it'll take me a month or two to finish it yeah. um, where I can watch the cutscene movie in one sitting. And, it's one of those things where it's like the influence that some of these series have had uh, because of the the veer or that left turn that the production companies like Naughty Dog and these other companies and um, um, God, I, I uh, like Bungie uh, back in the day when they were doing the Halo games yep. and um, the, the, the company that uh, was uh, Bioshock. Um, and, oh, um, yep. Yeah. Uh, that wasn't Bethesda, but yeah, I know who you're talking about. Well, yeah, and Bethesda's another one. You know, like you get you get these studios that they are like story they're pushing first. You. Yeah. yeah, it's story first because we know we can do the other thing. So yeah. it's like when you really start getting these excellently written and, and acted stories and then you get to play them. It's like it's a completely different experience. And if there's anybody listening to these that are that are writers that um, that aren't gamers per se, I'm not a gamer. Like I, 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 you know, I don't pretend to be. I play, I play what I play, and I only play what I like. Like well, that, I'm, yeah, I don't that's online. It. I don't do any BS like that. I'm literally no. playing the Uncharted games. I'm like I have like seven or eight video games, and I think I've and most of them are Uncharted. So it's like I'm very like like you know or like uh, the Fallout the Fallout three and or, you know yep. Fallout four um, and you know you're there's like games like that where you have like these massive stories and the the way that they're written and you're just like it does worlds of help as a writer myself when I see when I see it enacted in just a very different way versus just silver screen. No, totally, totally. I mean. 
I I remember Metal Gear Solid, the first Metal Gear Solid game um, back in you know nineteen ninety nine with um you know where they went from doing the old two D to when they're using three D and they had you know David Hayter and that was Boys just Metal, Snake Metal Gear back then, right? Uh, yeah, so you had Metal Gear was the original like Nintendo yeah. games, and then yeah, it was the um, over the had, top camera view. It was really the eight bit like kind of yeah. Then you had uh, Metal Gear Solid, yeah, which was uh, nineteen ninety nine. That was Shadow Moses, and yeah. that was when there was three D with the blocky faces where there was no like every time they yeah. talked, the heads were moving like this. <laughs> yeah, it was uh that. So you're you're just talking Goldeneye, like original Goldeneye yeah. kind of style, like yeah, yeah, um and. Yeah, you know, I, I had a PlayStation. I didn't have an N sixty four. Sure. Um, which you listen to our Golden Eye episode on Armchair Directors. I, you were just bitter. I, I, you were bitter. The only reason I was bitter was because the guy who who I who had an N sixty four who I was friends with, he played it all the time. So when we I came over to play, he play, would odd job he you would, to death. Yeah, he would. No, he'd let me be odd job and still. Oh, he would let you play ass. odd job. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah that's and right. he'd still whoop my ass. So I was bitter for a different reason. <laughs> but playing Metal Gear Solid that that kind of really opened you know that's a very cinematic game even though it's dated and the graphics mm-hmm. are shoddy it's still cinematic and then Metal Gear Solid 2 Sons of Liberty Snake Eater with the third game you know that yeah, really Snake Eater to... was like mind-blowingly good yeah yeah that one that was set, that in, Viet- was... set in Vietnam right uh that was set in the 60s so yeah it would have been around that time around yeah yeah because yeah, you're um time. you're you're still in, you're still somewhere in eastern block europe <laughs> true yeah um so it's more cold it's cold war era cold war yeah um you know and yeah that one plays as a really cool almost like a james bondian style mm-hmm. through you know, solid. those games really started to show me then uh splinter cells and all those yep. yeah yeah the splinter cells all those sort of games pandora you know, tomorrow re- yeah pandora you know, showed tomorrow. me that the was, power yeah. of oh yeah of storytelling when it came to games because you know you think about video games and you get your okay honestly the fighting games most of mm-hmm. the games i had on the um playstation yeah were the 2d like fighting games yeah tekken soul blade yeah. soul caliber all that sort of stuff so even there was the no earlier story. mortal kombat games where there wasn't yeah, a no story, story baked in yeah yeah so now or the sports games, games you had sports games which was just sports you know yeah the racing games all that yeah, stuff yeah. um so you know you, you're getting these games that come out and showing you you can tell a proper story and then you know, each with each new console, there is the the big game. So you look at, say, Gears of War, yeah. great story. Assassin's Creed, it's gone off the rails, but the early Assassin's Creed had mm. a very distinct, proper story, and it was actually a really well told story. Yeah, I forgot about and Gears then of War. War. I forgot about Gears of War. That was a yep. great story. Yep. And then for me, probably some of the best storytelling in video games. Okay, yep. Uncharted, undisputed. Bioshock, undisputed. But for me, it's the Batman Arkham games. Yeah, yeah, I know. Now, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a massive Batman fan. I will admit that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a massive Batman fan. But being able to play, like, I had played other Batman games where they're saying you can be Batman. You play, you go, well, this is terrible. You know, the the, the controls are janky. You're not doing anything <laughs> Batman would do. And then um, when Batman Begins came out, a game version, Batman Begins came out. And there's a lot in that game when you play it that they, the same company as Rocksteady, that they did Batman Begins. So they were already playing around with the certain ideas that they then perfected with Batman Arkham Asylum. Yeah. So gameplay way, they gameplay wise, they went from okay to really good. But the story of Arkham Asylum is incredible. And that's the first time you get to you play a game and you're like, oh, hell yeah, I'm proper Batman. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and then Arkham City. Uh, um you know arkham origins all that those games personally for me i you know i said uncharted won't you know undisputed but there's something about the stories that they tell the story that they told across the arkham games that for me i go yeah that's up there with say the mask of phantasm as far as batman stories way better than anything christopher nolan did and i don't care if the fanboys hate my guts (laughs) plus you had kevin conroy so, yeah, yeah, you had Kevin Conroy yeah, voicing yeah, Batman. Yeah. You had Mark Hamill Mark being Hamill. the Joker, except in Batman in Arkham Origins because that's a prequel. So it's um, Roger Craig Smith doing a damn good, young sounding Kevin Conroy, yeah, and Troy Baker doing mm-hmm. a younger but more unhinged and sinister sounding Mark Hamill Joker, and he nailed it. 
<laughs> yeah, and Troy Troy is probably more widely known for being Joel in yep. The Last of Us. And then he's also Sam in Uncharted Four and Five. So and doing, uh, he has, doing a great Christmas. Oh, Wolverine. he does. <laughs> and he was in he was in the Last of Us live action series as a different character, uh, which um, I didn't really get into, which is kind of sad because I really liked the games. But the, the series I, just didn't do a lot for me, unfortunately. I, I, I never I, and, played. And, yeah, yeah, I, I, I never played. Yeah. yeah, I never played the game. So for me, when the series was announced, I went, okay, I was kind of curious about it, mainly because of Craig May- Mason co-writing it he did the mm-hmm. chernobyl miniseries for hbo which is sure. incredible yeah um so you know i was like oh i'm curious and then i started watching i watched some clips i'm thinking yeah a couple of videos discussing the series from writing standpoint and all that and they're going yeah i think i'm giving a miss <laughs> there are there are, I, I can spend i can spend my time watching better things <laughs> yeah there there or were just, writing <laughs> there yeah there was just a lot of uh unnecessary changes and add-ons i'll just leave it at that that they did in the game in the series that just kind of cheapened it to me and unfortunately but uh yeah um but no yeah uh so like i know what this this next question is i know it, it can be very um i don't want to say convoluted but it can be one of those questions where there's really not like a solid answer i guess I, is, I've got um, a solid answer. Yeah, I know. <laughs> well, for you, for, that's why I said for you, I, I already know the answer and it's an easy one. So the, the actual process of writing, um, like, because we talk about it all the time, so there's really not a lot that I don't know. But um, it's, it's when... funny because I, I, I actually kind of did write out what my process is. I, I was cur- I sat down and wrote it out. <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. So the, so when I say process of writing, it's basically like what we were talking about earlier in the show is um, – I'm very visual oriented when it comes to mm-hmm. stuff. So whether I'm searching for images to use for book covers or I'm on a couple of the archaeology pages that I follow on Instagram, uh, just because you get these gorgeous pictures or you see like this, oh, this new thing was discovered in Turkey uh-huh. and it's like a Greek mosaic tiled floor. And you're just like, oh, that's neat. And I'm like, I need a character to find a mosaic of some kind. Or in, it just needs that it, that thing just needs to be because I just think it's so cool. And like so tapestries I'm, before mosaics. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But no, but I'm just like I'm very visual when it comes to stuff like that. So like I'll see something and go, ooh, that's cool. I want to see if I can incorporate that in a story. And um then it's you know, you start world building and then outlining and then character development and this and whatever. So, you know, like I always say there's it's kind of the pantser versus the outliner. Or yep. but I like to amend it because there's more to it than just panting and outlining. It's like, you can't just write the story off of nothing. You have to have something to start with. So even if it's a basic outline, you still have to have something to start with. But uh, I know you take it a step further with um, the dense outlines. Well, yeah, and and that's more, I mean, I I used to pants. Like when I was writing Mm -hmm. the scripts, I was a pantser. I could come up with a concept or a scene and sit down and just write a script you know like 120 pages movie script that was easy when i turned my hand to doing um doing um prose it was one of those things where i had the idea for what became the big smoke and trying to write it i couldn't um for some reason when it came to just doing straight prose my brain just went no even though i i can't i i saw it as a movie i even wrote a script version Mm-hmm. it just wasn't working and so i sat down and i went okay and I, I i didn't know anything about writing a book that was the thing when i wrote that book i knew nothing <laughs> and it shows <laughs> oh well, i mean when i started i i literally bought the um cliff's notes or not not the cliff's notes the um uh, dummies writing guide fi- <laughs> no yeah the dummies guide to writing fiction writing fiction for dummies and just to help me kind of organize my thoughts so See, was all, all the all the writing books I had at that point and all the reference books were all related to filmmaking. So sure. going from yeah. one discipline to another is it was, yeah. you know, I was arrogant. That was the that was probably the only thing that saved me was the fact that I'd spent all that time writing scripts. I knew how to tell a story. So I'm thinking, yeah, I, this is going to be easy. And I start writing it and I get to a point like, you know what, I need to know what's going to happen. And I, I forced myself to write an outline. And my outline's... Um, there, there's, it's a two-step process. You've seen both steps. Mm-hmm. 
but that's 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 evolved it literally is just going chapter one what's going to happen chapter two what's going to happen and it's usually one or two lines very short which gives me then the freedom of creativity when i'm actually writing those chapters sure and over the course of writing and outlining books i i even short stories if i write a short story i still need to outline it doesn't matter how short it is i just need to know where i'm going and i one day i was going i was online searching things and i came across uh the lester dent formula and yeah, for those who don't know yeah you've talked I know about this with me before we've talked yeah, about go it ahead. yeah yeah I've, we've talked about it off camera <laughs> yeah. yeah 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 so for those who don't know who lester dent is he was a uh, pulp fiction writer who created the character of doc savage and he wrote 90 percent of the doc savage novels it's like something like 175 novels were published he wrote about 160 of them something like that yeah and he wrote a lot of short stories and he came up with this formula to write a short story and uh, the formula is this if you've got a 6,000 word short story you've got to write you divide it into four parts each part is 1,500 words and then you break it down to in part one you introduce your character in the world part two he gets into trouble part three he gets into more trouble part four saves the day end of the story it's a and you know he was able to write so many short stories off that formula and he sold it that's the thing the whole uh, his whole thing was you've got to write fast you've got to be able to sell fast so you need to know what you're doing and i saw that I went that's pretty cool you know I then read a, compa a um, companion article by Michael Moorcock, who was a sci-fi writer, and he talked about the fact that he took, in the 70s, he heard about this formula and wondered if you could put it to a novel size, novel-length book, which was, at the time, 60,000 words. And he was able, on an old-fashioned typewriter, because it's the 60s, he wrote a 60,000-word book in three days. <laughs> Jeez because oh, typewriter oh my gosh yeah all yeah. oh, those guys were crazy and that's the thing he took that instead of going off six thousand words right it's sixty thousand words divided into four parts it's fifteen thousand words and so you yeah. just start breaking everything down and so I, I i went oh that's cool i'm going to give it a try on a book i had to write for seven and i did so i broke it down i said okay if the book's going to be say let's say sixty thousand words i know where my act breaks are i know where the middle of the book is and yep. i know where the end of the book is and having those big moments i was like okay this makes things easier and then from there i could figure out how many chapters i needed so then when i was outlining i could say all right i got this many chapters roughly and i could just write knowing okay you know at chapter say 17 this this is the end of act one so this is what needs to happen and what I uh, do now is once I figure all that out, just the uh, word count and chapter number, I then go, okay, act one, these are the big things that need to happen. Act two, big things that need to happen. Big three, big things that need to happen. Then I break it down even more. <laughs> and you've seen this one where I go act one bullet points. And I usually put in brackets chapter one to whatever the end of that act yeah. chapter should be. And then, you know, I break it down and those become just bullet point lists and then from there i will then write okay my proper outline which is literally chapter, chapter one by chapter yeah chapter by chapter and it's very loose it's very much you know it could be as detailed as you know character discovers you know this is this happens this happens this happens or it can be literally rampage or chase <laughs> yeah yeah i've been doing that in um i'm currently outlining uh Black Sunset, which is the second book in the Zara Kane series that Nick Tacker and I are produce. Yep. And um, I've gone out of my way to really try to get a like a real outline done for it. Because um, I've always liked the idea of doing it, but I've always been more of somebody that just wants to just get going on the story and just go to yep. town on it. Because I, I just, I like producing the story. I just... Yeah. That's like that's what's enjoyable for me. That's what's fun for me. Outlining for me has always felt more like work. And um, you know, the one thing with writing for me, especially since you know, I I had a full time job through most of my writing career, was yep. 
I didn't want it to feel like work. You know, writing was my creative outlet. And that was like, uh, but it, you know, as, you know, as you do with all industries and especially a industry that is a creative based industry, um, you look to improve any way or any way you can as yep. you do it long enough. I don't want to say you stall out, but you, you, you get to a certain point mentally to where you're like, you know, okay, whatever I do, I do really well, or I feel like I do really well, but I still know I can get better. What's yes. the next thing that is going to get me there? And then just talking with you more and talking with Nick and talking with guys like Rick Chesler and David Wood, who I've known for a long time, um, they all do more or less a full chapter by chapter outline to, to varying degrees with, with density. Um, and I, I didn't, and I'm just kind of like, okay, well, cause usually what I'll do is I'll write the book. And then as I'm writing the book, I start outlining while I'm writing yep. as I already have an idea of where the story's going Well, I'm like, well, let me get the outline going earlier on this particular book with Sara just to um feel it out and get it going it's it's just to see how it's and i'm you know i'm a decent amount in already with my outline you know i'm i'm not quite halfway there but i'm a lot further in a beginning outline than i ever have been and um i'm very confident once i actually start writing the story uh, i've got a lot of other things going on for another reason why i haven't started the story just time um so i've i've purposely decided to take this this little bit of time to outline it and um it's it's coming along good so I'm, I'm i'm actually kind of happy with it and excited with it um because i can really develop uh the story and then what i do is it is like based on like locations i'll yep. go okay what can i do with the characters based on the the already the story arc that i built in these specific areas to move it along to the next i don't i don't break it down like by quarters like you do um but for me it's it's more like where are we now where do we need to go how do we get there and what can you do in the meantime and that's yep. so it is kind of in the moment outlining it's not really looking too far ahead no, so it's kind not. of the same writing style i do where it's very in the moment but it's the the actual story development is now an outline instead of just yeah. writing and i i remember when you uh when you started the relics of god book and you said, you know, yeah. you you said to me, you know, you're going to try shorter chapters. Yeah. And I said, it's going to be easier for you. <laughs> yeah. And, and I then, remember when I was finishing that book, I told you, I'm I'm like 25 chapters left of the book and they're all outlined and ready. And you're like, what? Yeah. I said, yeah, like, I just, I, 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 I got to a certain point in the story to where I needed to stop because this was like the build to the climax. And, um, and I do that. I'll take like a few days, just yeah. don't write. And then just really focus on the, the end sequences and um, I just probably late one night after, you know, doing stuff and I just sat there and just because I knew exactly where I wanted the story to go, but I didn't have the, the mental capacity to actually sit there and write it. But I didn't want to forget it. Yeah. So I just and usually I'll just write notes down and then come back to it. This time I didn't write the notes down. I just went there and went, OK, chapter this, boom, chapter this, boom, chapter, because now I'm like it's rolling in my head and I didn't want to put it down and forget it. And then all of a sudden, two or three days later the story's done and i'm like not the writing but the story was no. done and i was like oh but yeah and then the last however many chapters they they went by in a blur because i already i already knew what i was doing so i get well, that, it I, com I completely understand it yeah. i'm still trying to figure out i guess my own method of doing it that Which, feels but that, that's it you know you had such a great time i think when you were talking to me telling me about you know you're, you're you know doing the shorter chapters and you've got that final part outlined and it's just flowing so easily I'm sitting here going, yeah, that's why I do it. It makes yeah. it easier. <laughs> and, well, and that's why what... it, you're talking to like a noob right now. Oh, like, yeah, yeah. As far yeah, as yeah, my but... reaction, my reaction is <laughs> a new guy going, wow, this is amazing. This is cool. This, And then the veteran going, well, yeah, it's supposed to be. So but yeah. that's usually my reaction to other authors where I've been in the game a little longer than some. And my well, reaction that's... is like. Well, yeah, <laughs> just... well, that's it. Because I've said things to you, <laughs> and you've, you know, like I've had those sort of realizations, and you're yeah. sitting there going, "That's right, yeah. dumbass." <laughs> I, I and, you and this is part of the reason why. I was probably I... thinking it, but I don't think I called you one. Oh, I was definitely no, you... thinking it. I was definitely. No, you've thinking not called me dumbass. Know. You called me other things. <laughs> I have called you other things. I have yes. called you other things. Yes. <laughs> but um, like that's part of the reason. Like you said, it. I I write fast. 
And that's the thing, having it outlined the way I do and knowing that, okay, you know, what's happening, even if it's like in the, if I'm at the beginning of the book and I know what's happening at the end of the book, I can plant things as I'm already writing it. Mm-hmm. Um, I can do my setups for things that need to, you know, the setups and the reveals, or if I introduce a, a weapon, you know, that the old Chekhov's gun thing, I can take care of a lot of things beforehand instead of writing the book and then seeing they're going, how the hell am I going to make this work? <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Yeah. Which no. And yeah, which, that's yeah. And, and, uh, but honestly, I, I, you know, and I've had moments like you where, you know, I've been uh, writing tra- out, it's been a- travel, travel logistics. When you, when just- you, when you write action adventure stories, <laughs> travel logistics are like one of the biggest <laughs> hangups that it's like a nightmare because you're just like, like, I don't, I guess in the action adventure genre, I don't like, you do it for different reasons, but I don't like doing the classic action hero location drop. Yep. I like getting there and all the difficulties that can happen doing it. Like, well, I would say more the majority of people that fly. Yeah. There's going to be some sort of delay somewhere. That's just the realistic thing of it. So it's like, well, my guy should have a delay. And then... What happens during the delay? Maybe he misses yeah. a connecting flight. Well, if he misses the connecting flight, now he's late. So what happens if he's late to this job or this? And I'm sitting here going, huh, okay. Well, maybe he has to go to a hotel for the night. Maybe they send a spy after him. Maybe something happens. Wait. And now I'm just sitting here going, okay. And now it's like four more chapters of action that's going to happen. Which is great. I mean, honestly, for, and for what I'm running, like, for example, doing yeah. um, Blood Angel, going from Guanajuato to Mexico City, that's a four hour, four hour, five hour coach ride. Mm-hmm. Moving around Mexico City, because I did it for five years, I know how long it all takes, so I don't need to bother with yeah. delays or things like that. Also, I because I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm riding still from the eye of the camera, which is you cut out all the boring stuff. You don't need to yeah. show them traveling. Yeah. And with The Hunted, I do the location drop because, okay, we're, we're going from our hero to the villain. We're yeah. going to different cities. Yeah. So when, when I swap to, say, the villain and I put the location, it's a way of letting everyone know, okay, we're with a different character. Sure. Um, yeah, and, no, it's different, and, different and, and, strokes and had, for different that, folks, different and genres. And we had that discussion. Um, yeah, we've had it. You know, yeah. Talking about Alex Wake, you, you know, you're like, okay, we've got to figure out how long it's going to take to fly from Key West to Venice and then how, you know, moving around the city itself, how oh, the timing of everything. You're saying all this. I'm sitting here thinking, we can cut around. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, 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 I do have some, sometimes I have that mentality of instead of spending all this time figuring it out, we can just skip it. Yeah. Yeah. And then, I will... then me trying to outline how, how do you travel around Antarctica? <laughs> that That's actually been one of the most fun things I've heard you talk about <laughs> because you're going from being super yeah. excited because you're learning all this stuff to really frustrated because what you because i've learned all this stuff do, what you originally wanted to do is never going to work wasn't going to work so it's one of those well, things where I, i'm yeah, but that's also going, like me going this is great <laughs> yeah well that's also me going does it matter and in my head i'm going yeah it if it bothers you this much then it obviously does because like What's in it? my head i'm going it's if it wasn't like an uncharted jungle. See, that's the problem with the action adventure stuff is you you purposely, and that's the point of this, the, the 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 genre. You purposely drop your characters in these wonky locales. Yep. Because it makes it hard on them. It makes it eerie. It makes it suspenseful. It makes it this. I, so I, you're I, sitting I, here going, it's natural that you're gonna have like you're in a jungle. You ain't driving anywhere. Well, if you're hiking, well. Now you're sitting here going, it's going to take weeks. <laughs> it's like, mm-hmm. this isn't just, oh, it's which, six hours. Which is no. <laughs> why I, I, I subscribe to the movie, the yeah. way of the movies, which is, it doesn't matter if you're in the jungle. You've got to get to a certain point. You just cut. <laughs> well, I've done it, but then I've gone, okay, well, what what do you, which I'm, which I, again, I'm, I'm not arguing with you. I, it, I completely understand. But then I'm also like, what happened from point A to point B? There, there has to be something yeah. that happened because it's never easy. 
And maybe that well, is no, maybe uh, that's but that's also that's also the adventure genre. Well, that's the it. idea that's is it. to make it as difficult as possible we, yeah. to get there. And that that my job is my job is different, I guess, in that I need to because there's sometimes there's just no dialogue because say Jack Riley or Zara or somebody is just alone and they're just they have to yeah, get so somewhere. It's, it's the internal thoughts now. It's and... the internal thoughts. It's the struggle that it's man versus nature. It's that kind of stuff where there is no bad guy. It's just the situation and the environment that he's in is the bad guy. And I mean, if you if anybody has read any of my books, I feel like I'm good at getting my characters into ridiculous situations when there's no call for it <laughs> without it not making sense. Yeah. I, like so like I, I've, a I've read, I've read 70 books. foot Titanoboa in the middle, you know, in the Colombian, you know, in in, in southern Colombia, Brazil area, for no other reason <laughs> that when I wanted a big snake, and I read that the Titanobo is endemic to Colombia, damn it, I'm gonna have a big snake because. <laughs> which which <laughs> it's like, honestly, I've read your. Books I'm like, I have yet. to figure out because I need to put that thing in here, and here we are. <laughs> See, I've read your books, so I, I you know, it yeah. works. That's the thing, but in the with the. With the spy you know, stuff, yeah, and with the yeah. spy stuff, with the action through stuff, yeah, yeah you, you 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 kind of need to speed it up a little bit because yeah. they're the readers are going to be more interested in the actual action, yeah, and the story, the char- character uh, interact because because that's the thing with spies yeah. and stuff. It's usually very character interaction versus man versus nature. Yeah, which is yeah. which is funny because I um the first version of the Blood Angel that was the thing I realized was that Connie was alone for so much of the book. So she's doing a lot of internal yeah. thinking. And I'm thinking, you know what? This is boring. I need to have, you know, a traveling companion. You know, mm-hmm. you think about Bond. He's always got the Bond girl. You think of Ethan Hunt in the um, Mission Impossible. He's got his crew. Or Born, Bond has some sort thing. of contact. Yeah. Yeah. So you need to have someone they can talk to and all this sort of stuff. And so I had this character who popped up at the beginning of the book. Um, her old CIA handler, Wes Parker. Yeah. He popped up at the beginning of the book and then he, we didn't really see him again. He did make phone calls and that was really it. So I had the, I, I went, you know what? Let's make him the companion because of this, of what happens at the end of the book. I'm thinking, yeah, if he's there for the majority of the helping her, when we get to the ending, it's going to be like, what the hell kind of thing. Yeah. 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 It makes it just that much sweeter. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, and that was something that Dan Brown talked about in his masterclass, which is, you know, in these sort of books, you do need to have someone your main character can talk to. Otherwise, it's all internal. And most readers will skip big blocks of text. You know, if they don't see quotation marks, they're going to skip it. And I have to admit, I've been guilty of that, you know, reading fantasy books when I was younger. Mm-hmm. Um, for example, Raymond, Raymond E. Feist's uh, Magician, you know, getting these big descriptive passages of the castle and crap I don't care about. Just get to the action. Give me shorter passages. Give me quote, give me talking. <laughs> yeah, my least favorite thing as a uh, as a consumer and now as a publisher <laughs> is when you have scenes that are uh, set in the past just for like, you know, setups. And the entire chapter is in italicized. Ooh, no, 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 now, no, no. I don't pretend to be like a 100% expert on stuff like that. But it's something that I've seen regular, semi-regularly. So I know it's something um, Steve Alton did a lot um, with uh, Domain. And uh, the, the books in that series, I remembered mm-hmm. seeing it a lot. So uh, there are bigger authors, big authors that have prescribed to that method where if it's set in a past time period or maybe even a different, just different time period, it's italicized and it's like an entire chapter. Yeah. And I just, okay. I read that and go, or I'll see it on the page and go, oh, that's just so ugly and that hurts my brain. And now it's like, you're used to the font that the book's in, right? Yep. And then, and then you, you get, get an entire this... page of a different font because <laughs> they italicize. It's it's basically a different font. And so now you're for... like, I read I read it slower. I have to because it's it's my brain. It's harder to read. It's harder yeah. to read as fast. 
It is. It's like script. Oh, yeah, no, I, 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 just I, like... I, I don't doubt it. And honestly, so for Ooh. anyone out there who wants to submit something to Conundrum Publishing and you want to piss off Matt. <laughs> well, the good news is right? I, can just, I can just unitalicize it and <laughs> I can just reformat it. <laughs> True. So what, what, what would be worse to see? A whole chapter italicized or a whole chapter in Comic Sans? <laughs> man yeah that would be rough (laughs) but um going back to the original question about the process (laughs) um but yet no my process has changed quite a bit and one thing i used to do as far as outlining outlining would take me forever yeah because i was figuring out all the story problems so i'd start an outline get to a point realize it wasn't working and start from zero yeah and with the last two books, um, with uh, The Hunted and Alex Wake 1, the outline came like that. Yeah, I was shocked at how fast you put, put together um, the outline with, with Alex. Although we did do a lot of um, world building and story development before you got we, started. We did. So that definitely we helped. We did. Um, yeah. That did help. But, and also um, during the research, mm-hmm. um, watching the documentary, uh, the, Lost, uh, the Lost Leonardo, that kind of cemented a bunch of stuff that we needed for the setup and what we can include. Yeah. Um, but it's one of those things I did realize this the other day, the reason why my outlining skills has gotten tighter mm-hmm. deadlines. That's been, that's been something I realized because yeah, I know, know a lot of people that say that. So, yeah. Yeah. And honestly, um, cause before I, before I would just kind of go, I give myself a, you know, like a little personal deadline and say, okay, I need to have the book done by this point oh i know authors so I that put it. books on pre-order on amazon that haven't written it yet yeah because that's basically I, I, their their deadline. promise yeah their their deadline yeah see for me um because i don't i i don't i'm not going to do that because i hate self-publishing which is why i'm happy yeah. to be working with conundrum i don't do um, it because i also know that um uh poop happens and uh no 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 no, no. You, you've, you've, you've missed it you should go and uh because i know that um uh live uh um, finds a way <laughs> yeah life gets in the way and finds a way and can drastically alter things yes and that deadline is now pushed back even a day or two and it completely and with Amazon. Utterly... yeah it it's not it's not fun to do that because no, just, but, so yeah i don't want to get into the, that kind of mess no and and the thing i realized was you know we we did we we've talked about we've got you know you gave me um you know, you told me the release dates for Alex 1 and Alex mm-hmm. 2. I'm thinking, okay, I can work everything else around it. And then we had a conversation a week or so ago where we, you, with everything I have planned to write for the rest of the year and early next year, yeah. you've gone, okay, you know, what about this sort of time period for the releases? I'm going, great. That, that, you know, that works for me. And then the other day I asked you, well, if these are the release dates, when's the date for delivery? And we figured that out. And yeah. I'm looking at everything and I'm going, right. So I ain't thought, and I figured out I've got this much time to brainstorm an outline, which I can do once I finish my writing for the day, because I write for, in four hours a day. That's the other reason I'm fast. Yeah. <laughs> um, joys of not having a family, not having responsibilities. Yeah, I used to be able to write a sixty or seventy thousand word book in in in. I used to be able to write a book a month, no issues, easy. Yeah. And then it's been like, well, oh, I got an email. Oh, I got to contact that author. Oh, I got to get send a contract to that. I need to get that artwork done. I need to pick yeah. up kids from school. I need. To... <laughs> so it's like, oh, and by yeah, the I'm, way, I'm, I'm, I'm an author. I'm I need to envious. write this. It's like, yeah, yeah I'm not envious of you, sir. Um... So... <laughs> And it's very easy if people have time. It's very easy because, you know, if you, know, if well, you yeah. can write two short chapters a day over a month, you're talking 60,000 words. Yeah. You know, if you want to write a thousand word chapters or if you want to write bigger chapters, and it's very easy. If, 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 you, if you cut it down and you give yourself that daily goal, and even if you skip a day, okay, well, maybe one day you write two, two chapters and you go nuts, or maybe your chapters are just denser and bigger, so there's more words. It's very well, easy. It's a very yeah. easy process if, if you have... The schedule to do it it's a very easy process. Well, yeah that's it it yes. is very easy and, the, and see I, this is the other big big thing that changed for me the hard I used thing to is write. knowing how to write because the english language oh. is dumb yeah no see knowing how it's to not write as, not as dumb as the the 
uh, uh, masculine and, and feminine words. Feminine in Spanish, in, no. In Spanish and Italian, yeah. That's, that's uh, yeah, I wasn't going to say that. Actually, see, yes. for me, um, it's not about being able to write because you read, say, Brandon Sanderson, his prose is very basic. For me, it's mm-hmm. being able to tell the story. That's what's key. Yeah. And everything that I do is for one thing, the benefit of the story. So for that, that's part of, also part of the reason why I cut traveling and I cut certain things. I'm like, it's not important to the story. But then there are other things I expand on because I'm going, well, it can, it's it's not for the story, but it's for adding the extra bit of spice. <laughs> yeah, it's a character development or story development. Like I, I like I, I've talked about it on a, a few different shows where there's a specific scene and I just keep referencing it in the Undying Kingdom where um, Jack has to travel somewhere in Nepal and uh-huh. you know i am somebody that's never been to nepal so i'm doing all this research i'm finding out all these amazing facts about this country and and of course you know uh uncharted 2 is set there so there's a lot of like familiarity with just the vastness and like the story because of shangri-la and stuff yeah. and i'm like they travel somewhere it's early in the day i'm like and then i, I read an article about food and i'm like well jack's from wyoming and he's like you know he's a military guy but he was you know he's just like your typical average american guy and i'm like he's probably never been in a, like so i'm like okay so i need to bring in like the local culture uh-huh. local cuisine just because i find it interesting and i think through the eyes of jack it would be interesting because he's experiencing this for the first time so like he has a, Nep- a nepali breakfast yeah. I have no idea what that is, so I looked it up. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. That's cool. And, of course, Jack's reaction is like, huh, okay. Just because he's, you know, steak and eggs and yeah. coffee and whatever. And I'm just – so, like, things like that, it's like, no, it has nothing to do with the plot of the story. It no, nothing but it to just do with makes it. it – it makes the world real. Yeah, it makes the world real. And that's – but and I guess that's also just, again, reiterating – Genre to genre, it changes. It's different. Yeah, it's oh, definitely. It's expected in adventure world travel, travel adventure stuff. It's expected to do stuff like that because it does heighten, yeah, the experience. And then you know, and that's yeah. the thing. You know, like with uh, the Blood Angel, we're in Mexico, so anytime I talk about food or certain things, I go a bit more into the detail because, you know, most people when most people think of Mexican food, they think Tex Mex. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, they, yeah. They think they think fake Mexican food, Americanized yeah. Mexican food. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the other thing that really kind of changed my process was this: I used to write for words, so I used to kind of set myself that goal of two thousand words, two and a half thousand words mm-hmm. per day. And then when I moved back to Australia, I got cocky, so I said I'll do three thousand. Then I do four thousand. Now that's a great thing to say, but you miss the goal. You don't reach that goal. You're going to feel terrible. And then it happened to me. So then the next day I would try to catch up. I would feel even worse and spiral down. The writing would get terrible and I'd become grumpy and intolerable and everybody hated me. <laughs> and <laughs> so you, you, you didn't really get this experience, <laughs> that part of me, because no. by the time we really started talking and everything, I changed. Um, the Dan Brown masterclass, he talks about that and he took, and what he does, he writes for time. So he says, he writes from 4 a.m. to um, like 11 a.m. And it doesn't matter how much words, how many words he actually writes, as long as he writes from 4 to 11. And so I went, hmm, I'll give that a try. Now, I, I'm not going to get up at 4 a.m., actually no. 3 a.m. so I can get ready. No. So I just say, okay, I say, right, I'll write for four hours. I'll do just four hours of writing. And I did that. And the first day I got about a uh, was it seven and a half thousand words? And I just went, ooh. <laughs> the next day, similar numbers. And it kept going. And then there was a day I sat down, I did my four hours, and I got a couple of thousand words. It was like 3,000 words. And I went, you know what? I did my four hours. That's what matters. And then the next day, I was back up to the six, 7,000 word count. And then life got in the way. I, my sister has two da- daughters, and every now and then I've got to help babysit them. On those days, it's like, well, okay, you're not going to get right because you've got a two-year-old, three-year-old, and a 20-month-year-old kind of, you know, so you can't really write. They leave, and they say, right, I'll get two hours done. As long as I get two hours, it doesn't matter. Yeah. 
And slowly I figured out that I, in one hour I can write about 2000 words. So that, you know, doing four hours a day, I can get 8,000 or I, if I push myself in four hours, I can get, you know, close to 10,000 words. And there's been a couple of, there was a day when I had, I wanted to, I knew I was going to finish the hunted. So I did six hours <laughs> and got yeah. 13,000 words. And then the next day I had a hangover. Um, yeah. <laughs> so. But that's the other thing, you know, you, you know, you, you're, you're slowly changing your process. You're slowly, I don't want to say getting better, but you're improving things. Yeah. And that's improving, improving I've, the process. Yeah. Which is and that's just, what I've, yeah. Yeah. And I've been doing that and I'm now at that point, you know, I've got, um, you know, the, the, uh, you know, the final two blood angel books to write. I've got two addicts wake books to write. I've got a couple of other series I'm going to start writing for you guys. So it's that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Knowing how fast it takes me to do certain things. I know for a fact that if, if the release date is here and the delivery date is say a month, month and a half beforehand, I know for a fact I can make it, which, yeah. you know, to me, that's very liberating. Because also now I, 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 I'm like, yep, I've got my release schedule here. Mm -hmm. I've got my delivery schedule. Guess what? It's a real job. It's clock yeah. in, clock out. And and I know you were talking about how you, you know, when you're working at Total Wine and all that, you didn't mm -hmm. want to have a, yeah. you know, you didn't want this to become a job. For me, having all that stuff, it proves to me this is a job, which means I'm going to get paid, which means I'm yeah. not a bum. <laughs> I'm not a schlub. No, yeah. It was, more, it, it, of, it it was more of that work job mentality because I, well, yeah. I, because I've, you know, I've, I've done it and you, anything that's a job, you inevitably, it starts to wear on you and you start to uh, not want to do it anymore because yeah. you get, you get burned out from it. And then like getting burned out from writing or getting burned out while writing, which we've all, it's all, it's happened to all of us. Oh yeah. It's different because of what I'm doing. Yeah. I'm, I, I'm, I accept it because that just means I've been working hard. That means I've been producing stories. It's different than working 50 hours, 60 hours a week, you know, of, yeah. of big box retail and then yeah. coming home and going, now what? Yep. Oh, because you totally. have you besides totally. your paycheck, which retail, so not a lot to show for. There's nothing at the end of that rainbow that really matters. Yeah. Like in and but that's also coming from somebody that has like this has this thing that he's trying to work on versus somebody that is trying to become management, trying to make it a career, trying to you know this, trying to retire from it. Like, like I never wanted that never did in my life and, and hopefully never have to go back. And, uh, I don't that's, think you it, will. It, it's just, it's the mindset of it all. It, it's, you know, yeah. the, the job was to get my bills paid, but it wasn't my future. And then, um, when this opportunity arose, um, as you said, it was liberating, uh, because it, I realized that not that I make a fortune doing this, but I, I you know, you do well enough to pay the bills, but you're doing something you truly love. And yeah. that's, that's if, if that's why I said, if I can make the same money I made doing the other job, but I can actually do something I want to do, like truly want to do. That's all then I'm asking for. Yeah. You're golden. You're golden. Yeah. So, um, to kind of close out a little bit, um, I like to do this. Uh, this is a little, t uh, the, the beginning of this one's a little tough because, uh, book recommendations and it's one of yours and one of somebody else's uh oh no i've been thinking about that <laughs> one one of yours one of yours is is you know hmm. fairly easy um, it's so, going to be the blood angel yeah it's the blood angel but what i will say is because you know these shows are forever when it comes to audio podcasts and youtube um i also people that pick this up maybe later um i also want them to steer them towards um the hunted which is going to be blood angel part two uh, we're going to have Midnight Mass coming out, which is the first book in our Alex Week series, which is going to yes. be a banger of a story. I'm really, really excited um, for just just everything about it. Um, yeah. well, honestly, then, me too. I, I'm actually um, rebuilding the soundtrack that I'm going nice. to be listening to. Nice. And then you're also going to have Blood Angel 3 coming out. And then yep. um, 
not too much details, but um, in like a sentence or two, give us a little tease on the other new project you're going to be doing at the end of the year. Uh, okay, so um, see Roscoe Harper. Um, yes. Very, very, very briefly. He's the personification of wrong place, wrong time. He He's washed up on a small Caribbean island that is basically a center for criminal activities. So you'll have the Yakuza, you'll have drug cartels, you're going to have Russian mob there, and mm -hmm. the whole town is filled, this whole island, this main city on this island is all filled with criminals. And we're going to follow on his wacky adventures. It is very much, cool. um, I'm calling them a Caribbean thriller. Um, it's Elmore Leonard in, influence. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, in the first story, he's going to get caught up in um, the Russian mafia and counterfeiting. <laughs> Nice, nice. Yeah, uh, it, it, it's it's a genre. Um, tropical thrillers is another word for it, um, where there's just an inherent an inherent um, odd zaniness to the series yep. that is expected. Uh, a, 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 a friend of mine, mutual friend, uh, David Barons, uh, he has his Troy Bodine series that yep. is like that. There's other big time uh, Wayne Stinnett. Um, there's a lot of really really big. Um, Caribbean tropical thriller type series where it's just a little bit more oh, man I don't know how to describe it because there's there's like a there's a lightness to it but there's not it, it yeah it, it's, it's it's a more relaxed but it's yeah, that's still a, yeah, that's the way for me I, I like to say it's loose yeah it's loose it really is it it, it is because um, a lot of the characters are very loose and laid back uh, it's island life right so i mean it's yeah. so that just... so so you're 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 going to be listening to a ton of jimmy buffett um, <laughs> I, I actually um the the playlist for that one is going to be more jazz infused yeah, yeah i'm a big jimmy buffett um, guy so I, I i that's just that island even though he's from new orleans which is i i think's really funny <laughs> but he just fell in love with the caribbean and fell in love with the beaches and, well that's uh, what that's what happened to me in mexico um i i, I want to go to cuba I would love to visit Cuba and all that sort of stuff. So with yeah, this one, this, this, with the Roscoe Harper stuff, the setting I is a setting I've wanted to use for a while now. Um, mm -hmm. It's this great idea I've had for this island that is just known to be a center point for criminals. Sure. Which I think just opens up all the possibilities for just fun and having this character yeah. who, who no one knows where he came from. No one knows who, really who he is or why he's there who doesn't care he's just a, he's a gambler he's a womanizer he's a drinker yeah. but he does have a very strict moral code i can't go yeah that, that, that's for me coming up with that character and all that to me it's like oh yeah that's gravy that's gonna be yeah. so fun to write <laughs> and then um a, a book or two honestly whether it's a series or a standalone whether it was a book that you just enjoyed the hell out of or maybe something that inspired you um, I um okay, so I'm going to go with two. Yeah. Um, the first one, it's David Baldacci's The Innocent, which is the first in his Will Roby um, Hitman series. He talked about that book a lot in his uh, masterclass. Mm -hmm. So I read the book, and it's it's a chunky monkey. It's 145,000 words long, but it's it flies. It's so well written, and the pacing is incredible. Um, cool. So if there's anyone who wants to write like these sort of uh, action thrillers definitely have a look at that book it's also just a damn good book now the other one i have to admit it's one of yours <laughs> oh okay all right it's it's um forgotten fortune oh, the okay. first jack riley Thank book you. yeah now I, I i read that when i was in mexico and i read it and i really enjoyed it and then i reread it when i was in hotel quarantine after getting back to australia sure. in 2021 and i was reading it and I could hear the Indiana Jones music playing in the background. It was just a great experience. And as for an introduction book, it's a short book. It's a very short book. Yeah. But it's just, I'll put it like this. And this is not hyperbole or anything like that. If you got the chance to write an Indiana Jones novel, it'd be like that. Yeah, that was, that was my... Uh, rededication to like traditional proper action adventure when I said, if I'm going to do this, I am going to do this in the most 
like matte way that I can think yeah. of, which is just taking all of my genre influences and just packing them all into one world yep. and go, okay, here's your character. This is who he is. And this, it, it, that, like I said, that series was like a very big, like, uh, it was, it, it was almost like an eye opener for me because when, when I was writing that book and I was kind of, cause I had dabbled in other genres between sci-fi horror, uh, some creature stuff. And then, mm -hmm. um, I, I had an attempt at an assassin thriller that didn't, didn't go as well as I'd hoped. I read that book. I liked it. Yeah. Uh, Beautiful dragons, which was, yeah, called I read the it. I enjoyed it. Yeah, I tried yeah. to market it in different titles. I changed the title like three times. I changed the cover like four times. Just, it's just in whatever. Anyways, uh, that's that's a book that's a probably a better movie than a book, uh, honestly, because of just <laughs> visually, like in my head, why I, how I was writing it. But the the Jack Riley stuff was just um, like all my eggs in one basket into a series. And when I did it, I realized that you know this is where I belong. I'm going to quote stay in my lane at this point because. I know I'm good at it and I enjoy it. And, yeah. um, you know, you dabble your toe in something else just to get the feel for it. And then you kind of pull back and go, okay, I did it. And now I'm done. And, um, that opened up more and more and more possibilities for other projects. And, um, you know, Jack is Jack. He's my baby. I absolutely love that series. And, um, I, I'm always thrilled to hear, uh, people, uh, you know, say kind words about that series or that book in general, the forgotten fortune, because, um, action adventure, punching Nazis. It, it, there's just something about it that just, it, it just, it feels right because yep. my influences being indie mm -hmm. uh, big time. Um, so yeah, that, that, that book has a special place in my heart because it really did relaunch kind of my, um, no, it didn't really relaunch my career. I don't want to say that, but it, what it did was it kind of solidified yep. things. And it, 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 it put it, you on it, the path to be the man you are today. Well, no, it did that, but it also, it also just gave me direction, mm -hmm. you know, because yeah. w when you are all over the place, a lot of the time you also miss opportunities because you have an idea for something, but this sounds cool. This is the shiny new toy. Yep. And you write the shiny new toy, and then for whatever reason, you don't go back to the other thing. And then when you finally do go back to the other thing, you kick yourself in the butt going, why didn't I do this sooner? Yeah. And it's like, you know, that's why if I just dedicate myself to this action adventure stuff, you know, even with the action thriller stuff included, um, I just, I, I feel like I can do anything because I understand it. Well, that, that, that I 100% agree there. Um, you know, I, I have the same feeling with, you know, switching, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, if I ever get the, get another idea for an hour of Blackstone book that I think it's going to be amazing, I would probably write it, but sure, that's a long shot. <laughs> cause no, I mean, cause, cause I'm, the ideas yeah. I've had for hour of Blackstone, I've looked at those ideas, the unwritten stuff. I'm like, okay, I can write that. Just take out the monsters and it would still work. So there's no point going back. Last thing, now that I'm writing, you know, like, for example, you know, I, I, I sent you guys six pitches, mm -hmm. which, you know, that's that sort of thing where if I was going to send a pitch to Civic Press, it'd be like two or three, but that'd take me a long time to work on. Whereas here, it's like, I've got these ideas. Yeah, you got all these ideas flowing. flowing, yeah. So I completely understand what you were saying about, you know, this is it. This is your... You know, yeah, like I have this story I've been wanting to write forever. It's never yep. going to happen. So I don't care if I talk about it. It's called Planet Hell. And <laughs> it's it's Mars Colony, um, like like sp space horror, you know. Yep. And uh, and it's like, like I could see it as a movie in my head. I can see the scenes writing them. Like it would be this amazingly epic, massive, just awful book in, in, in a good way. <laughs> Like yep. just creepy. And that's a good thing about writing stuff like that is because you can really do stuff that you just have to pull back on in other stuff. Yeah. And like, you don't have to pull back in this. This is our, this is like hardcore. Like this is going to be like, it's supposed to be awful. That's what it's supposed to be. That's what I did with Sub-Zero. Um, I went as hardcore as I could think of. And um, I got a reaction out of a lot of people about that. And it, which means I, I did my job. 
And, yeah. but like, I want to write that book so bad. And I'm like, but I know I'm not going to, because mm-hmm. I just, a, the physics of it. I'm not Andy Weir. I, I don't get that part <laughs> like space stuff. Like I don't have yeah. the, the, I don't have the bandwidth to like understand most of it. I haven't done the research on it. There's like so much that I would just flop and just ruin because I don't have the depth for it. So it's like, I can see it, but it's not something that I know I can write. So I just, I, I, I would just, just push it aside I... and go, well, yeah, it's, it's the same idea. It's like, it, it's yeah. like these, these great stories, but it's like, it's... Oh, I've, I've got a, I've got a fantasy one. I want to write. I, um, I yeah. wrote a short story for an anthology that didn't happen and it was, uh, I came up with this character that was going to be like a kind of like Conan, Conan the Barbarian kind of thing. And I was like, man, I could write so many books with these, but I'm not going to yeah. because I'm not a fantasy author. No. But, and then you'll get, you'll get like a quarter of the way into the book and go, why am I doing this? <laughs> well, yeah, that's the thing. If I had written it, I probably would have, I, I'm a stubborn idiot. So I probably would have finished it yeah. even though it would have been a painful thing to write and then go, well, I wasted time. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I oh, know I've done that. Yeah, that's Believe the thing. I, I, I still I, have a book I, that's half finished from like five years ago. So <laughs> I'll see. I um I Which I, I stole I, all I, the characters and just put them in a different book called Cradle of Death. Oh, that's fine then. <laughs> but <laughs> the know. actual story I was like forty something thousand words into it when I abandoned it and I'm like Oh I uh Oh that was a lot of that was a month and a half I'll never uh, have back or whatever however the, long the, that was. The Valley of Beach, oh man. I wrote fifty thousand words of that and realized because I did the outline, I got to 50,000 words and I realized it was terrible. It wasn't yeah. working at all. I scrapped 50,000 words. It started from zero. Everything started from zero, even the outlining. Oh, jeez. And, and I did, and I was able to write, this was back in like, this was just before November in 2020. So it was October. And I rewrote everything because my plan was to write that for NaNoWriMo. Mm-hmm. So I had to do a quick rewrite and everything. <laughs> and I went, you know, I don't care. And within the space of two weeks, I had the outline done. And then for the rest of November, I wrote it. And yeah, I, you know, it was one of those things. I told other authors, oh, yeah, I threw away 50,000 words. And they're like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Been so, there. But, see that? like the first version of the principle it's 97,000 words none of it is usable so that's 97,000 words gone but for me it's not a problem because I know I, I wrote the bad version now I can write the good version yeah and you can you're gonna you're gonna use more of it than not probably and you just have well yeah to, like yeah. I'll, I'll look I'll look at the um, outline and then when I do the new outline I'll go back to the old outline and say okay I can reuse this chapter and that's why uh, you know doing rewrites i do that but um but yeah so those are my two recommendations <laughs> cool yeah i mean like usual i mean if people don't know our armchair directors podcast uh we don't end shows well so um uh well, meaning that when we get to our final thought then another thought more. takes yeah. us another 15 minutes through or longer into a rambling tirade of bleh and uh um, so, uh so Matt, why don't you tell everyone where they can find you if they don't know where to find you? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no. Well, what, what I'll do first is um, I also do want to plug um, uh, one more time with uh, Blood Angel is out now. Book two will be coming out. Uh, I think the tentative release is going to be May twenty sixth. Yeah, just, that's what we agreed. Yeah, just in case, uh, May twenty sixth is the planned release. Should be going on pre order within the next. I'd say hopefully within like the next week, uh, as of as of recording this episode. Um, um, my book, the blood King, which is the first book in the relics of God series, uh, is coming out on May 12th. So that is and, currently and on pre-order. Just, and just so everyone knows, Matt's kept me up to date. I know about this book. It's going to be a banger from everything he's told me about it. It's going to yeah, be a banger I was of a book. Very happy with, um, my main editor proofer. Um, she got back to me as she's been sending me edits and her response and her replies in the emails have been um, more like giddy and more like over the top excited than usual. Like she's read every single book that I've ever. So this is my thirtieth book that I've produced is is the Blood King, and um, she's read them all, and uh, she's done edits on a lot of them, uh, the majority of them, and yeah. um, uh, her 
she's been very, very vocal about how much she loved that book. So I was very, very happy to hear that just from somebody that knows my work that may not be as like giddy about it and fanboy about it just because she's kind of been here for the long haul. Um, she yeah. was very, very excited with like twists and turns and things and, you know, things coming out of left field that she was like, oh my gosh, that was so cool. That was, oh my God. And I was like, wow, that's coming from you. That's kind of cool because I'm kind of old hat to her now. So, yeah. uh, so yeah, uh, Blood King is out. And like I said, I am producing, um, I'm currently putting together the story for Black Sunset, which will be Zarkane part two. And then, like I said, you and I will be putting together Midnight Mass, uh, yeah. Alex Wake part one or book one. So, um, but yeah, uh, so finding me, um, personally, uh, you can find me at mattjamesauthor.com. Uh, you can find me all over Facebook. I'm on Instagram, uh, conundrum publishing, conundrumpub.com, uh, this show, real life fiction, uh, audio podcast, as well as the YouTube channel. Um, and then also rich and I's podcast armchair directors. Uh, we have a Facebook group, which is facebook.com slash groups slash armchair directors podcast. And then you can also find it on all of your uh, podcast apps. And that's audio only. Uh, we do that once a week. And yep. occasionally we'll bring on um, author friends of ours to kind of sit and chat about specific movies that they're fans of. Like we've had Kevin Tom Tomlinson on to do Ghostbusters, uh, three different Ghostbusters movies. And more recently, we had Andrew Clausen on to go through the Indiana Jones, uh, the original Indiana Jones trilogy. Yep. Uh, so um, that's a fun podcast. It's one that Rich and I uh, have been doing um 23-ish episodes now. Yeah, I, th um, I think the one we're recording this week is 23. I believe it is. So, yeah. Uh, fun show if you just like general movie stuff. It's just a fun, you know, we go through a different movie on each show and uh, just kind of talk it over and just kind of BS about it. It's a fun show. So um, It's nowhere near as structured as this one. No. And, um, <laughs> Rich, I know, like I said, as we're um, – recording this you are in the process of revamping and redoing websites yes so um, if people people want to find me it's yeah. at the moment just instagram and it's uh facebook it's richard f padden uh p-a-d-o-n -D mm -hmm. author yeah so and yeah. <laughs> um the other thing that we need to do is really push um most people on amazon on amazon uh find us both on amazon and hit that follow button uh the yep. follow button on amazon is very important because that's where you get your new release alerts uh, whether it's a pre-order or whether it's the actual release day, you'll get an email saying that Rich's new book is coming out or my new book's coming out. Yep. Um, it is a huge, huge, huge thing for us, especially us um, smaller and uh, indie authors and or slash hybrid authors yep. um, that don't have the big publishers, you know, financing their marketing and stuff. So uh, that's a big deal is that follow button to make sure that you guys see what we are producing. So uh, thank you very much, everyone, for watching. Thank you for listening. Um, I really do appreciate it, and uh, we'll see you next time. Rich, as always, thank you. My pleasure, sir.